Something dark and impossibly huge moves beneath the surface of the water. A woman in a kayak paddles across the surface of a lake, following behind a few other kayakers. She starts to fall behind and paddles faster to keep up. For some reason, she's growing noticeably more and more anxious as she paddles. She keeps glancing down at the water, eyes wide, sweat beating on her forehead. We can't see what she sees, but something down there is terrifying her. She paddles faster, 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 and doesn't see the rock up ahead. She hits it, her kayak tipping over, dumping her into the water. She splashes frantically, trying to tip the kayak back over and climb to safety. But just as she's about to grab hold of the edge of the boat, something unseen yanks her down into the water, out of sight. As the other kayakers turn around to see where she went, they see the capsized kayak and bright red blood blooming across the water. The young woman sits back in her chair, pushing her sunglasses up onto her head to get a better look at the book she's leafing through. She takes a long, deep breath, relishing the smell of salt and seaweed, coconut-scented sunscreen, and sun-baked sand. She stretches her legs, feeling the sand between her toes, almost too warm to be comfortable, but not quite. It's a perfect day at the beach, warm but breezy, bustling but not too crowded. It's the best way to kick off summer break after the exhausting grind of exams. She glances up from her book and watches with an amused smile as her best friend trudges his way out into the water, wearing the unwieldy water shoes she always gently mocks him for. They slosh with every step, so loud she can almost hear them over the rush of the tide. But he doesn't care about what he looks like. He only cares about what knowledge the sea has to offer. He's an ecology major with plans to become a marine biologist and uncover the mysteries of the deep, so it's a given that he's taking the first opportunity to poke around in the water. As an English literature major herself, the young woman will stick to the dry, sunny beach chair, the book, and an ice-cold lemonade. Even though the two are opposites in many ways, they've always gotten along, ever since they first met during freshman orientation. He teaches her about sharks, she teaches him about postmodernist fiction, and they both broaden their horizons. It works. Why question it too much? She got a bit lost in the reminiscence, watching her friend in his natural element, but the heat is starting to get to her, and she could use a little refreshment. She reaches for her drink, taking a sip, and glances back out at the water. Wait, where'd he go? He was right there. But all of a sudden, she can't spot him anymore. She's getting ready to call out his name when she sees a hand break the surface of the water, followed by another hand, both splashing wildly. Her best friend emerges, paddling, gasping for air. Her stomach drops with the sudden realization that something is terribly wrong. He starts to scream, but the sound is swallowed when he's pulled back under the water once more. She calls out for help, signals the lifeguard, but by the time help reaches him, her friend is gone. Not dead, not a body floating on the waves, just vanished. The only thing left of him is a dark bloom of blood, visible even from the shore. All at once, the picture-perfect day at the beach is cut short by tragedy, and the young woman falls to her knees in despair, barely even feeling a thing as the tide rushes in around her. In the days that follow, she can't fathom doing any of her original summer vacation plans, the two of them were supposed to be enjoying the break together, but instead, he's gone, and she doesn't even have a body for the funeral. She can't stop replaying the moment over and over in her mind. One moment, he was absolutely fine, enjoying a swim and looking for different wildlife, and the next, he was drowning, screaming. What could have been responsible for a sudden disappearance like that? At first, she assumed it must have been a shark attack, in spite of all her friends' efforts to persuade her that sharks were nothing to be afraid of. There's no such thing as shark-infested waters, he often repeated. We infest the waters. They just live there. Even so, she couldn't come up with a better explanation than a shark. But when she brought up the idea to the lifeguard on duty, he insisted that it couldn't have been a shark. There hadn't been any spotted in the area, not during the day and that close to shore. Besides, and he put this as delicately as he possibly could, if a shark had gotten a hold of her friend, there would have been some pieces to find. With no body, no answers, and no closure, she spends her days clearing out his room in the campus apartment they shared. Going through his things, sorting out what to send back to his family, what to donate, what to keep. It helps her feel close to him, even though he's gone. 
And if she's being completely honest with herself, part of her is still clinging to the hope that she might find some sort of explanation here. She boxes up the remainders of his books and is just about to leave for the day when she spots one that she missed. It doesn't look like any of his textbooks or the nonfiction he was so fond of reading in his free time. It's an old, worn, leather-bound volume, tucked under the bed like a secret. She sets the box down and reaches under the bed for the book. Its spine is unmarked, no title to be found. Her curiosity peaked now more than ever. She cracks it open. The room fills with the scent of mildew and dust. The book smells as old as it looks. The title page has been ripped out, but as she begins to peruse its contents, she sees descriptions of ancient sea monsters, of unfathomable horrors of the deepest ocean. It's a book about aquatic folklore. Why didn't he tell her he was reading this? They could have bonded over folktales, over him enjoying something fictional for once. She considers tossing the book in the box with the rest, but instead, she slips it into her bag, feeling closer to her lost friend than she has since some unknown force took him from her. That night, as she's preparing for bed in her own room, trying not to think about the uncanny silence of the newly vacant room across the hall, she cracks open the old book again. She thumbs through the pages, skimming the accounts of leviathans and krakens, taking in the intricate illustrations of sea-dwelling beasts. She turns the page and freezes, eyes locked on the illustration there. Something is different about this one, though she can't put it into words. Its face, its enormous, monstrous shape. It makes her feel cold, sweaty, and seasick. Her hands tremble, scarcely able to maintain their grip on the book. None of the other creatures illustrated here have made her feel like this, like she's truly locking eyes with a deadly predator. She slams the book shut, and the feeling of dread ebbs away. It's just a book. It's just a drawing. It can't do anything to her. Besides, it isn't as if it's real. That night, she tosses and turns, her mind tormented by visions of deep, dark water crushing her with its pressure, of gasping for breath and swimming for a surface she can't quite reach. All the while, she feels something swimming just below, rising up from the ocean floor. In her dream, she wants to turn and look, but she can't bring herself to do it. She knows what she'll see, opening its mouth to swallow her whole. When she wakes the next morning, her heart is still racing and her sheets are soaked with sweat. She takes a moment to remind herself that it was only a dream, that she's safe and sound in her bedroom on dry land. She peels herself out of bed and walks down the hall to the bathroom to take a shower. But when she turns the knob and water begins to gush from the shower head, her stomach turns. The idea of getting into the shower starts her heart pounding again, adrenaline coursing through her veins and begging her to flee. She turns the shower off and the anxiety abates. No shower today then. That's fine, it's just a bit of the previous night's dreams lingering. As the day goes on, it'll pass and she'll feel like herself again. But all day, the feeling persists. She walks by the public pool and shudders at the sight of children playing in the water. She crosses the street to avoid a sprinkler spraying someone's lawn. She jumps over a puddle with the intensity of someone avoiding stepping on a landmine. She's never felt like this before. Grief can take a lot of unusual shapes. Could this be another one of them? She ducks into a nearby coffee shop and settles at a table with her laptop. Her fingers hover over the keyboard, and she wills herself to look up coping mechanisms for grief and unusual anxiety. But her instincts kick in, and she types something else entirely. Unexplained disappearances in water. She scrolls through stories about tragic drownings, cars sinking into swamps, and murder victims dumped in lakes. Then, a headline catches her eye. Local man vanished in swimming pool, family say. She clicks the link and finds a story that feels eerily familiar. A family was enjoying a day at the pool when one of the children pushed his father into the pool as a joke. He seemed to panic upon entering the water, thrashing violently before disappearing entirely. Though the water was clear, they couldn't see him anymore. He never resurfaced. A wave of nausea washes over her as she realizes that this has happened before. How many times? She continues her search, reading about similar disappearances in lakes, hot tubs, and even one man who vanished in a charity dunk tank. Several of the reports describe the missing persons as developing an unusual fear of water prior to their disappearances. Sometimes there is blood left behind, sometimes there's no trace at all. But with every story, the result is the same. 
Someone is inexplicably pulled under the water, and they are never seen again. But why? She searches for a common thread between the stories, something that could link them together. Is it possible it's all just random? But then she spots something, a throwaway line in the first article. The missing man was a cryptid enthusiast, particularly obsessed with the Loch Ness Monster and other aquatic creatures. Another was a writer, researching for a monster movie set on a fishing boat. Another was the president of her high school folklore club. It hits her like a bolt of lightning. Of course, all these people were led to their horrible fates through the research they were doing. And when did she begin feeling this state of dread? When she'd looked into that terrible, nightmarish book she'd found at her friend's home. The same book that's now sitting in a drawer in her desk. Her thoughts race with all the horrible possibilities. Could it be some form of psychosis she's dealing with? Or something even more terrifying? An honest-to-God curse of some kind? A supernatural affliction that put her in the crosshairs of some terrible underwater beast? She grabs the book out of her desk, wondering if maybe taking another look at the thing that started all this could dispel her fear. There had to be some kind of rational explanation, but she can't bring herself to turn the page. Just the thought of looking at that monster again makes her head feel light and causes her skin to break out in a cold sweat. Suddenly, she feels parched. If she doesn't get some cold water to drink, she might pass out. With no time to waste, she runs for her ensuite bathroom, grabbing a clean glass from one of her cabinets and filling it with nice, cold water. But as she lifts the glass up to her mouth, she feels another injection of that impossible, icy dread. Is that something moving in the bottom of the glass? Almost involuntarily, her grip loosens, and the glass of water falls to the floor, shattering. She screams and vaults away, not startled by the flying pieces of shattered glass, but genuinely terrified by the puddle that's now on the floor. She feels an inescapable sense that death is lurking in a small puddle rapidly sinking into her dorm room carpet. That moment clinches it. She needs to find some way to solve this, or she'll inevitably go down one of two paths. On the first path, she turn into a reclusive, paranoid wreck, forever fearing the dark fate that may or may not come. On the second, she'd be just like her friend, a red smear on the surface of some unknown body of water. Her research rabbit hole becomes an all-consuming obsession. She stops going to classes altogether, building a spider wall of newspaper clippings and printed off articles on her wall. There are so many disappearances and inexplicable events around water she believes may be related to this aquatic horror. It takes weeks of research to find something she can actually use. Another survivor, one just like her, who'd encountered the creature and used his smarts to survive. After a few emails and calls, proving that she wasn't just some tourist fascinated by madness, the other survivor agrees to meeting at his house in Nebraska, the only triple landlocked state in the US. She drives several hours to reach the home of the other survivor. When he meets her at the door, she's a little taken aback by his appearance. He's a young man, but he's got the chapped, weathered skin of someone much older. His hair is burnt and stringy, his lips glistening with dead skin. He's clearly cultivated a kind of dryness that most humans would consider unhealthy. When she enters the survivor's home, she's immediately greeted by the hum of multiple dehumidifiers going off at once, giving the air a stifling, desert-like feel. Every inch of the floor is covered in newspapers, ready to soak up any moisture that might fall. Seeing all the procedures that the survivor needs to go through just to avoid the aquatic horror fills her with a different kind of horror. Is she looking at her future right now? Is it worth surviving this thing if this squalor and paranoia is what survival looks like? The survivor explains his long and sordid tale. He'd once been a deep-sea fisherman when one fateful night changed his life forever. While they were trawling the vast and distant oceans, they'd picked up a man flailing in the water who told them an impossible story. Just moments ago, he'd been in his bathtub when something dragged him underneath. When the survivor and the rest of the crew asked him what had done this to him, he described a terrible and immense beast underneath the waves, and just the description was enough. In the following weeks, one by one, the other members of the crew disappeared, all during circumstances dealing with water. The survivor developed a crippling fear of all things water and has since moved to Nebraska to get further away from his fear. As far as he's aware, there's no cure, just a way to eke out your existence and minimize risk. But of course, even if your risk of encountering water is low, it's never zero.
as these two unfortunate people are about to find out. There's a thunder crack above the house, a genuine bolt from the blue, as huge, ominous storm clouds roll in. Then comes the rain, the worst rainfall that Nebraska has seen in decades. Hammering down on the roof of the survivor's house while he and the young woman wait inside. The roof would only hold it back for so long, and as another great doctor once said, water always wins. The young woman and the survivor begin to panic, but panic will do them no good. The house has sprung a leak. Water is dripping from the ceiling and slithering down the walls, disintegrating the newsprint and forming deep, dark puddles on the floor. The duo tries to escape, but the second they accidentally step into a patch of wet, they're pulled down into the dark, gasping, flapping, and struggling for breath. They're not in Nebraska anymore. They're floating in the middle of a vast and impossible ocean with no land in sight. Below them, in the murky waters, something impossibly huge moves. It's futile to escape. In her quest to understand what happened to her friend, she's about to gain a better understanding than she ever would have wanted. As the beast rises from the depths and closes its jaws around them both. SCP-1128 is an enormous aquatic predator that only manifests to those who are aware of what it looks like. Anyone given a full description of the entity's appearance or who has seen an illustration or image of the entity will become infected by it. Once infected, a person behaves relatively normally aside from an increased aversion to any activity that requires being submerged in water, such as swimming. If an infected person is fully submerged in water, they will disappear beneath its surface. It does not matter whether or not the water is actually deep enough for someone to be pulled beneath the surface. In fact, during one experiment, a D-Class was pulled into a glass of water by the entity, at which point he disappeared from sight. After the subject has disappeared, one of two things tends to happen next. Either they reappear in a state of panic, trying to leave the water before the entity can grab hold of them again, or the water will begin to fill with blood and other organic matter belonging to the subject. Subjects that reappeared and managed to escape the water before being attacked again have described the experience of being transported to the middle of a vast ocean where SCP-1128 attempts to devour them. Though these interviews provide vital information on the nature of SCP-1128's methods of hunting, they must be conducted with extreme care as they carry an inherent risk of SCP-1128 infection if the subject is a bit too descriptive in their account. Thankfully, any accidental exposure to a description of SCP-1128 can be treated with the application of amnestics. Any written descriptions or images of SCP-1128's appearance or videos of the entity breaching the surface of the water found outside of the Foundation's custody must be destroyed, and anyone exposed to this information or showing signs of contamination is to be given Class C amnestics. A written description of SCP-1128 is to be kept at an assigned Foundation site for experimental purposes and experimental purposes only. It may not be read by anyone other than D-Class selected for testing with the entity. If any staff are exposed, they must immediately report for administration of Class C amnestics. Any and all water traffic that passes through the area thought to be SCP-1128's usual habitat is to be intercepted by Mobile Containment Force Kappa-12, Sea Devils. They are authorized to do so by any means necessary. It's been said that we know more about outer space, the vast, endless expanse of stars and planets, than we do about the depths of our oceans. So I suppose the existence of an entity like SCP-1128 shouldn't come as too much of a surprise amidst giant squids and nitrogen-breathing microbes. Still, one of the most comforting things about the horrors of the deep has always been, in my opinion, the certainty that we are safe from them on land. SCP-1128 is proof that, as soothing as that notion may be, it is entirely false. Danger doesn't just lurk beneath the dark, rolling surface of the ocean. It can find you in a swimming pool a bathtub, a single glass of water. Ordinarily, I like to pursue as much independent research as I can into the topics that I cover, always in pursuit of more answers, of a broader understanding. In this particular case, however, I believe it's best to let sleeping aquatic horrors lie. SCP-1128 can remain a mystery to me. Whether it's fish, mammal, or something else we've yet to categorize, I'm happy to leave it alone, rather than wind up as its next piece of bait. Two massive creatures are locked in a fight to the death in the middle of the sea. Destroyers, cruisers, and battleships fire special weapons and harpoons at one of the creatures, attempting to help turn the tide in favor of one. 
but they appear to have almost no effect on the gigantic monster. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-3700, also known as the Tides of War. SCP-3700 is what the SCP Foundation has labeled an 800-kilometer circular area in the North Sea. Located southeast of Iceland and north of the United Kingdom, the circle contains the Faroe, Orkney, and Shetland Islands. The seafloor is abnormally deep in this area, at roughly 5 kilometers below the ocean surface, roughly 20 times deeper than the rest of the North Sea. SCP-3700 experiences all kinds of strange, anomalous activity, including extreme weather and geological events. These are caused by the interaction between two separate entities, which have been designated as SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2. SCP-3700-1 is an arthropod resembling the common lobster, except this crustacean is 6 kilometers long. It has a variety of blue, yellow, pink, and red markings carved into its carapace that resembles a woman's face. It has six arm-like limbs, four of which have claws, with two having club-like appendages on the end, and eight legs. It also has four orange eyes at the end of stalks. 3701's carapace shows significant damage, with many scars, cracks, and even some holes that reveal its soft inner tissue. It has several anomalous capabilities that it uses in its battle against SCP-3700-2. Its two club-like appendages are capable of striking, but they also produce a cavitation bubble that generates a force equal to several tons of dynamite, similar to what the mantis shrimp is able to do but on a much larger scale. Two of its eyes are able to project concentrated blasts of gamma radiation, and it's able to stop storms or other weather phenomena. Despite being 6 kilometers long, 3701 can reach speeds faster than 100 kilometers per hour, and has even shown the ability to demanifest and disappear if it doesn't locate SCP-3702 within roughly 15 days after appearing. SCP-3701 appears to be friendly in nature and shows some small signs of intelligence. When accompanied by Foundation ships, it will either ignore them or provide a small amount of aid by helping to move disabled craft away from danger. After appearing, it travels the full 800-kilometer area of SCP-3700 in a spiral pattern from the center out toward the edge. Interestingly, the center is the exact center point between the three island chains located within the circle, and is home to numerous shipwrecks. Since being first discovered by the Foundation in 1922, 3701 has slowed down considerably in its movement and has lost a significant amount of mass. It was first measured at a length of 16 kilometers, a full 10 kilometers longer than its current state. It also appears weaker and seems to be having a much harder time subduing SCP-3702. SCP-3702, on the other hand, looks like it belongs to the family of ray-finned fish and has an appearance that closely resembles the pelican eel, except that it has 13 appendages encircling the middle section of its body. These appendages look like the tentacles of an octopus, complete with suckers, and can tuck them into its body when not in use. 3702 is currently 32 kilometers long, and opposite to SCP-3701, it is growing larger having only been 300 meters long when first identified in 1945. Most of that length is the creature's whip-like tail that ends in a sharpened point. It's currently roughly one kilometer wide at its largest point, and each of its 13 tentacles is around 60 meters long. Its most distinctive feature is its massive mouth, which can open up almost three kilometers wide. 3702 is black in color with white, purple, and red bioluminescent lines that resemble a man's face on either side of its torso. SCP-3702 can create sudden changes in the weather, generating huge storms and Category 5 hurricanes, as well as massive whirlpools that suck in any vessel within 150 meters before grabbing them with its tentacles and tearing them apart. It's also able to produce high-energy sound waves and streams of blue fire from its mouth that it uses to destroy close-range targets. 
SCP-3702 appears at random locations within the 800-kilometer area, except during the spring and autumn equinoxes, when it appears at the exact center of SCP-3700. It stays submerged unless it encounters 3701, or another object, and will demanifest roughly 15 days after first appearing. It's extremely hostile to any creature or object that approaches it, and has even been witnessed destroying entire pods of whales. Conventional weapons have no effect on it, and even special anomalous weapons used by the Foundation have only had a moderate effect. Only 3701 has so far been able to subdue it. When SCP-3701 and 3702 do meet each other, they will engage in a prolonged fight, with each attempting to temporarily kill or subdue the other. Historically, the winner of each contest would swap depending on which half of the year it was, with 3701 consistently winning during the Northern Hemisphere's spring and summer, and 3702 winning during the fall and winter. However, since the Foundation has begun implementing containment procedures, SCP-3701 has won the last 64 cycles in a row. A number of changes happen when one of the creatures wins. When 3701 is successful, major storms in the area immediately cease, crop yields double, and local oceanic life increases their reproductive rates by a factor of three. This can lead to dead zones forming from the overpopulation of certain species of zooplankton. Erosion rates on the islands also increase by a factor of five which has led to the Foundation needing to bring in large amounts of dirt and sand in an attempt to combat it. When SCP-3702 wins and subdues or kills 3701, the weather becomes very dangerous with powerful hurricanes and rapid temperature changes that can range from below zero to over 28 degrees Celsius, capable of causing massive damage to buildings and huge losses of life. Travel by sea becomes extremely difficult due to huge waves and storm surges, making it difficult for supplies to reach the islands. Ocean food sources are driven from the area, and crop yields are reduced. Following its victory, 3702 does not demanifest, and instead, continues to patrol the area and attack vessels and will even approach the islands themselves. Foundation Naval Task Force Delta-7, nicknamed Northern Storm, is tasked with locating and assisting SCP-3701 in its struggle against 3702. Purchased from the United States military, it consists of 13 destroyers, 5 cruisers, and 15 smaller support craft. When Delta-7 locates SCP-3701, it will often acknowledge their presence by raising two of its claws into the air and clicking them while making a low, rumbling noise with its mouth. Delta-7 then accompanies SCP-3701 as it patrols its 800-kilometer area for 3702. Once the two meet, Delta-7 engages in Protocol Winter Maelstrom, where the destroyers shoot harpoon-based anchors into 3702's head, before moving in a circular pattern while they and battleships fire on it to ensure it can't orient itself. The cruisers, meanwhile, attempt to draw its attention by firing and moving in a serpentine pattern at a distance of 300 meters. The two creatures will battle, blasting each other with gamma radiation and powerful sound waves. They whip, bite, and club each other, cracking armor and ripping off tentacles and other appendages, until one finally stops moving and dissolves into the sea. Should SCP-3702 be successful in defeating 3701, then Project Tumult is activated, and the following procedures must take place. First, there is an immediate evacuation of all naval and civilian craft from the 800-kilometer zone. Next, all trade and ferry routes are stopped or rerouted for at least six months, and land-based aquatic defenses are activated. Aerial craft will continue to monitor and engage with 3702, while others continue to look for a reappearance of SCP-3701. Since it appears that SCP-3701 continues to physically degrade, and with the exact opposite being true for 3702, it's been proposed to let 3702 win and subdue 3701 twice every five years, despite the terrible effect on locals in the area. Though this plan has yet to be approved, it may be the only chance to stop 3702 from becoming so strong that 3701 is never able to defeat it again. Who are you talking to? 
The young boy spins around, surprised to find his father standing behind him. The boy seems nervous and hesitant to answer, but after being asked again, he admits to his father that he was talking to the lady in the fountain. The boy's father is confused. The lady in the fountain? That's right. The boy explains that she is nice, just like mom. He thinks the woman in the fountain may even be his mom. The father sighs. He takes the boy's hand and leads him back inside the house, where the father is hosting a small get-together. One of the father's guests asks if things are okay, and he tells her that everything is fine. He's just worried about his son. It has been a very difficult year following the death of his wife. He tells her that he's afraid he might be developing behavioral issues as he watches the boy staring out the window at the fountain in their backyard. Later that week in school, the children are supposed to be drawing pictures of their families. The teacher moves from child to child, checking on their progress, and stops at the boy. She wants to know what he's working on. The boy explains that it is a drawing of him, his dad, and his mom who lives in the fountain. The teacher doesn't understand. His mom lives in the fountain? That's right, the boy tells her. The fountain in their backyard was her favorite place in the whole world. His mother had told him that it was a magical place and was the reason they bought the house. After she died, he heard a voice coming from the fountain. It doesn't sound like his mom, but he knows it's her. She lives in the fountain now. The father thanks the teacher for calling and promises that he'll talk to his son. He's very sorry that the other children are frightened by the stories about a woman in their fountain and he's going to make sure this whole business comes to an end for good. That night, as he is putting the boy to bed, he tells him that he knows he misses his mom, but he needs to stop with all of these claims about a woman in the fountain. And as much as he misses her and wishes that his mother would come back, he needs to realize that she's gone and not coming back. The father kisses the boy in the forehead and tells him one more time that there will be no more stories about the woman before tucking him in for the night. As soon as his father is gone though, the boy gets out of bed creeps to his bedroom window that looks down on their backyard and stares at the fountain. He watches as reflections dance on the rippling water. The water goes oddly still, until a hand that appears to be made out of water seems to emerge out of the surface of the fountain and waves at him. The father leaves the bathroom and glances in to check on his son before heading back to his bedroom. He bolts upright when it dawns on him that his son wasn't in bed. He runs into the son's room and pulls the blankets off the bed, but no one is there. He frantically calls for his son and looks around the room when he sees something. He hurries to the window where he watches as his son walks towards the fountain. But what really has his attention is the woman, translucent and shining under the moonlight, beckoning for the boy to approach her. The father rushes downstairs and out into the backyard where his son is in an embrace with the watery woman. He is terrified, but his fatherly instincts take over and he sprints to the fountain and rips the boy away from the creature. As he pulls the boy back from the fountain, he watches as the solid, watery figure of the woman appears to turn back into a liquid and collapse into the fountain. The father brings the boy inside the house. He doesn't understand what's going on, but the father just keeps repeating that he's okay. He's safe now. The next day, the father is on the phone with their local priest. He knows how crazy this sounds, but the police didn't believe him, and he didn't know where else to turn. The priest tells him not to worry, that he will be there soon to take care of it. The priest arrives at the house with two assistants and tells the father that it would be best if he and his son leave. The boy is crying, pleading with him not to hurt the nice woman in the fountain. The father has to struggle to restrain his son, but eventually is able to get him out of the house. Once they're gone, the priest turns to his assistants. He takes off his shirt to reveal a tactical vest underneath emblazoned with the SCP logo as his assistants do the same. Time for containment, he says, as they head out into the backyard towards the fountain and the anomalous creature that lives there. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-054, also known as the Water Nymph. SCP-054 is the designation that the SCP Foundation has given to an anomalous entity with some very strange properties. Made up of nine liters of what appears to be completely normal spring water, SCP-054 most often appears in the form of a female humanoid, but it is capable of a variety of forms, such as other humanoids and simple geometric shapes. It is unknown just how it is capable of taking and holding these shapes, or how it moves around once it does so, since all tests performed so far have failed to show any thermal, electromagnetic, biological, or other phenomenon present in its body that could explain its abilities. Whenever SCP-054 enters a body of water, it will become indistinguishable from the surrounding water, 
and it appears that it must fully submerge itself on occasion in order to replenish its full volume, which is constantly being reduced through normal evaporation. Water that has evaporated off of the anomaly has also been collected by the foundation, and it too is indiscernible from regular water and exhibits no special properties. After its discovery, SCP-054 was moved to Site-08 for containment, where additional research and study of the creature could take place. Its special containment cell was made watertight and equipped with a specialized climate control system, as well as an ornate fountain filled with fresh spring water. Surprisingly, the entity seemed to enjoy its new home, and appeared happy to interact with Foundation researchers, guards, and maintenance staff, frequently mimicking their forms often in a playful manner. While at first, 054 would retreat back into its fountain when it wasn't interacting with staff, as time went on, it seemed to grow more and more comfortable, and eventually came to spend almost all of its time outside of the water. Though it would still always return back to the safety of the fountain and disappear into the water when attempts were made to extract samples directly from its body. Though it avoided having its water drawn, it was through a variety of different tests by SCP researcher Dr. Seskel that much of the Foundation's knowledge of SCP-054 was gained. Though whether the methods researchers used to acquire this information were appropriate is up to you to decide. In a test dubbed the Water Loss Experiment, SCP-054 was denied access to water. As a result, its shape changed, with 054 becoming more compact, most likely in order to reduce its surface area as much as possible and reduce the rate of evaporation that occurred. For the first few days after access to water was removed, it would happily greet anyone who entered its containment cell, which may indicate that it was attempting to charm staff into providing water. When after a few days its water supply was still not turned on, it stopped acting especially cheery, perhaps realizing that its happy disposition was doing nothing to advance its cause. In an extreme temperature test, researchers were authorized to experiment with subjecting SCP-054 to temperatures below zero degrees Celsius. The entity became more and more lethargic as the temperature in the testing area was lowered, and eventually froze completely. Ice chips were collected for study, but analysis revealed no abnormalities or differences from standard water. The opposite test was also performed, and the temperature was raised to 95 degrees Celsius, just shy of the 100 degree boiling point of water. 054 became very aggressive as the temperature approached the upper threshold at which water can remain a liquid, and it attempted to escape the testing enclosure. Researchers noticed that following this test, the entity became increasingly resistant to being moved from its containment cell to the testing area, likely fearing that the researchers intended to do it harm. SCP-054's memory was tested as well, and it proved very skilled at solving puzzles and navigating mazes. Researchers initially had an issue with motivating 054 to participate, but Dr. Seskel discovered that the anomaly was quite responsive to the use of electrical shocks. The researchers would often push 054 too hard in these tests, though, and soon found that they would need to give it a 48-hour rest period between any strenuous experiments. The final test performed was meant to gain some insight into how SCP-054 maintains its form, by seeing how it reacted to a hydrochloric acid solution. It unsurprisingly resisted this test, and the temperature in the testing area was lowered to just above freezing in order to try and control its behavior. This did not prove to be enough, though. SCP-054 fought back against Dr. Seskel and his research assistant, seriously injuring both of them and necessitating a halt to the test. In fact, all testing on SCP-054 was stopped following this incident, as it appeared to develop an extreme mistrust of males, who made up the majority of the staff who had been performing the tests. Following this attack on the Foundation staff, SCP-054 was classified as Euclid. However, once the tests ceased and 054 no longer had to come in contact with the research staff who were in charge of the experiments, there was a span of over five years without any further incidents. Following this period, SCP-054's rating was downgraded to safe and now seems willing to begin participating in experiments once again, though now all tests fall under the purview of Biology Unit E7 and the use of only female personnel is recommended. Though classified as safe, caution must still be maintained when working with SCP-054. Maintenance personnel are required to wear chemical suits when working inside the containment area and must spend 10 minutes in a special drying room once they exit to ensure that 054 has not somehow managed to cling to any part of them. In the event of a containment breach, the entire enclosure is to be flushed with liquid nitrogen to freeze the entity. Is the water nymph an example of the SCP Foundation going too far, 
containing a harmless anomaly who appears happy and benign until harm is done to it? Or is this simply the price we must pay in order to further our knowledge of anomalies and potentially stop a dangerous threat to humanity? The answer to that question is up to you. The storm wrenches the fishing vessel in half. The yawning sound of metal buckling and ripping can barely be heard over the explosive waves. Crew members pour out of the fragmented ship, washed away with the water, like ants fleeing a flooding nest. The deck lurches and tips upwards into the air. A wave crashes against it, almost knocking the sailor off the railing, but he clings on for dear life. Soaked through, shivering violently, and feeling the dreaded exhaustion creeping into his limbs, he looks around helplessly as his crewmates drown around him. Only one man remains on the deck with him, but the captain's usual steely confidence has gone. Behind the man's bushy beard and grizzled skin, the sailor sees a little boy scared out of his mind. The captain grabs the sailor by the scruff of the neck and hauls him close enough for them to shout over the sound of the seas around them. I saw her! The captain's rambling and ranting, repeating himself and gesticulating wildly at the seas around them. A naiad! I saw her in the water this morning! Our voyage was cursed from the start. We should never have left port. She's in the water now, she… A colossal wave throws what is left of the boat through the air. The railing slips through the sailor's fingers as he flies high between the waves. For a moment, the world stands still. It's like he's a gull hovering in place, surveying the carnage beneath him. And there in the water, what looks like… But the world isn't standing still. He hurtles back towards the ocean and slams into it, hard enough to knock the air clean out of his lungs. Icy water tugs at him, pulling him downwards, deeper and deeper, colder and colder. Like arms wrapping around him, dragging him. The sailor wakes with a start, water laps at his face. What were once hulking waves are now little more than ripples. He spits out a mouthful of sand and shakes his head, his body's trembling violently from the cold, but the warm glow of the sun on his back is already doing its best to help him. How on earth had he survived that? There are groans all around him. Dotted along the beach are his fellow fishermen. He hasn't got the energy to count them, but it doesn't look like all of them. Just ahead of him, further up the beach, sits the captain. Rocking back and forth, trembling, the captain noiselessly points a finger out to sea. Using what little energy he has left, the sailor rolls onto his back to see the silhouette of a woman standing there on the water. No, not a silhouette. The morning sunlight is shining straight through her as if she's made of nothing but water. She steps delicately across the surface of the water, walking towards the coughing fishermen who have all seen her by now. There's a delicacy to how she walks, tiptoeing gently on the rippling water, as if scared of disturbing it even slightly. The light dances and glitters on her skin like it does across the ocean. No, not skin. She really is made of water. Every inch of her is composed entirely of what looks like the purest, cleanest water the sailor has ever seen. Was it her? The arms that he felt dragging him through the water? Did she save him? Did she save all of them? The water nymph waits with the men until the ambulances arrive. She walks across the sand going between them. Every few minutes, she dips her toes back in the sea and takes what looks like a deep breath, even though she has no lungs to fill. Then she's back amongst them, offering noiseless comfort. There's an old abandoned house just up from the beach, what looks like the mansion of a former millionaire. In apparent fascination, the nymph keeps going over to examine the ornate fountain in the courtyard. Even in a state of disrepair, the fountain is stunning. She lowers herself gently into the water and disappears under the surface, just as the first ambulance rounds the corner. As the paramedics wrap the foil blanket around the sailor and walk into the vehicle, he catches the nymph poking her head out of the surface of the fountain's water. He's not the only one to see. Tucked just out of sight near the tree line is a nondescript black sedan with a group of men sitting inside. One of them takes a photograph of the water woman in the fountain, while another talks urgently over the phone. The sailor has barely been in the back of the ambulance for two minutes before one of the men from the car approaches him. The man holds an expensive-looking watch in his hand. Excuse me, sir, does this belong to you? The sailor sits up suspiciously. He's about to open his mouth to refute the man when the needle penetrates his thigh and the amnestic fills his bloodstream. By the time the sailor arrives at the hospital, all his memories of the previous 24 hours have slipped away into the abyss. The containment team is at work in less than six hours, while a group of agents, dressed in scrubs, follow the ambulances to the hospital to ensure all accounts of the ship's crash have been entirely erased. Another team sets to work, cordoning off the beach. 
A tourist family, excited about their day at the beach, argue with the disguised agents cordoning off the road. I'm sorry, ma'am, but there's nothing we can do. A shark sighting is a shark sighting. We just can't risk it today. Meanwhile, a steady stream of construction vehicles rumbles past, followed by a large Home Depot truck. They all pull up outside the mansion, where a team of agents has the fountain surrounded. Tasers and cattle prods at the ready, they grip their weapons at even the slightest ripple of water. Excavators get to work quickly, drilling at the ground around the fountain and cracking through the paving stones. And before anyone nearby has any clue of what's happening, the fountain has been removed, loaded into the back of the watertight fake Home Depot truck, and has disappeared over the horizon. The water nymph refuses to poke her head out of the water the whole way. The world around her is dark and dry. It shakes and rumbles for hours. The beautiful fountain she'd climbed into just a few hours earlier now feels tiny. There's barely enough water in here for her to swim in a circle. She'd always observed these strange-looking vehicles from a distance, lifting her eyes up above the waves for a few minutes to watch them crawling along the dark roads with their 18 wheels. She'd always wondered what was inside all of them, with their colorful paints and strange names. At least she now has some idea of what Home Depot does. Part of their business model evidently involves kidnapping. To stop the panic rising up too high in her chest, the water nymph focuses on stilling the water in the fountain. All of the bumps and turns in the road, she focuses all her energy on holding all the water in place and keeping it level. If the water around her is still, maybe she won't feel so scared. It isn't really working. But at least her precious little amount of fresh water isn't spilling out all over the watertight inside of the container. She's just about convinced herself that she's used to her cage when it suddenly stops. The rumble sound cuts out, the shaking stops, and voices somewhere outside discuss what to do with her, saying words like containment protocol, initial testing, and security measures. The water nymph dips her head back below the surface of the water as the rear doors open. She's going to make the most of this, that's what she's decided. Having spent all her life underwater, observing the humans from afar, she'd always dreamed of one day meeting one. There had been moments, sure, times when she'd wave at a child on the deck of a ferry or guide a ship through the fog, but up close, never. They look funny, these people. When you see them up close, they're such strange colors, so fleshy and hairy. It's bizarre not being able to see through them. How are they supposed to swim? These humans in particular are even more strange than the others. Dressed in long white coats, always walking around with clipboards and strange little devices that light up and make sounds when they poke them. She wonders if they get sick of having their legs stuck to the ground all the time. What if they see something interesting floating above them? They can't just swim upwards, they need to get on one of those plane things. This will be fun, getting to meet real people for the first time. She keeps telling herself that because if she doesn't, it all becomes too scary. They haven't put her back in the sea, a river, or even a pool. They've just kept her in her fountain. It sits right in the middle of a brightly lit chamber. Four white walls, a white ceiling, and a white floor. One white door. The lights are always on, the temperature always the same. For days and days, she just sits in her fountain, alone. Occasionally, one of the humans will come in wearing a big rubber suit. They look totally ridiculous. Taking big, slow steps, they'll approach her fountain. The first time, she jumped up out of the water to greet the human, doing her best to wave like she's seen them do to each other. But the human immediately turned around and ran back out of the chamber. So next time, she was slow and gentle, raising both her hands innocently and letting the human approach without doing anything. The human lowered some kind of glass container into the water in her fountain and took some of the water away. He must have been thirsty. She's seen the humans get like that sometimes. How they're not thirsty all the time, she has no clue. It doesn't look like there's a drop of water anywhere in them, except for their eyes. She tries to catch the human's eye as he leaves, but he just walks straight out of her chamber, carrying away the little container of water. But this time, she has an idea. She waits patiently for a few days, waiting for another one of the humans to come and see her. It's hard to tell how much time has passed, because it's always sunny in here but it must have been a few days by now. Sure enough, the door opens, and a human in another big rubber costume comes in. She rises out of the water slowly so as not to scare them and lets her form melt and shift. Feeling her body flow into a different shape, she does her best to copy the human's big rubber suit. She's practiced this for years in the sea, copying the shapes of different humans she sees. The human stops walking and stares at her. She tries to wave again. The human waves back. Success! For almost a minute, they stand there waving at each other. She knows this is longer than most humans would wave at each other, but it's just so exciting she can't help herself. 
Maybe this will be her first friend. Imagine that, having a human friend. The human takes a hesitant step towards her. This is her chance. Lifting herself up and out of the water, the nymph steps out of her fountain for the first time. She pauses, careful not to spook the human. They do scare very easily, but this time, he stays. Better than that, he takes another step towards her, then another until they're within touching distance. She can feel the water beating in her chest, pumping excitedly through her body. The human has another one of those glass containers in its hand. It raises the container up slowly for her to look at. She leans in to see why this strange little creature is showing her a piece of glass. She's seen these a thousand times before in the seas. There's glass and plastic everywhere for her to look at. What's so special about this one? The human takes a swipe at her. The glass container strikes the side of her head and extracts a chunk of water. She staggers away, hands raised in fear. What had she done wrong? Why did the human do that to her? She feels faint, her head swims and not in the usual pleasant way. Her body works hard to redistribute all the water around her body, rebuilding that part of herself in a split second, but it doesn't stop the pain or the sudden wave of tiredness. She stumbles back into the fountain and plunges beneath the surface, letting the water merge with her body again. But the surface of the fountain isn't still. It trembles and shakes as she lies at the bottom in fear. Why had the human done that to her? By the time she has the courage to peek out of the water again, the human is gone. The lights in the ceiling seem brighter than ever. The next day is the first time she really misses the sea. She would race from coast to coast, feeling herself getting dragged along in the ocean gyres as she flowed between continents. She would study the rainbow colors of the Great Barrier Reef before catching a current to Venice or Jamaica. She'd hug the bottom of cruise ships and dance in and out of the propellers on the backs of cargo ships. But here, in her cell, all she can do is swim around her fountain, round and round in circles. That is, until the humans return. Three of them come into her room, each carrying strange long objects. She's not sure she's seen those things before and is desperate for a closer look, but after what happened with the glass the other day, it doesn't seem like a good idea. She still hasn't worked out what she did wrong there, but clearly the human was not happy with her for some reason. Best to be very gentle with them for the time being, until they're proper friends. The three humans have a box with them, full of water. She's so excited to see it, she leaps straight out of the fountain before realizing she needs to be careful. Patiently as she can, she approaches the box and touches it. The humans nod encouragingly. Her excitement overwhelms her, and she dives right in. It feels so good to have fresh water to explore, even if it's just a small tank. She barely even notices as they close the lid on her and wheel her into a different room. A glass wall lines the edge of this new chamber. Funny little humans in white coats stand behind it, making notes. She climbs out of her little tank and waves at them. It's a smaller room than her normal one. Why have they brought her in here? A slamming noise behind her makes her jump, and she spins around to see the three humans have wheeled away her little tanks on wheels leaving her alone in the room. She looks around with a little anxiety. There's nowhere to swim in here. Have they made a mistake? She can't be here without water. Doing her best to copy human movements, she tries to mime to the people behind the glass that she needs her water. They don't seem to understand her, just start scribbling even more things on their clipboards. It's warm in here, warm and dry. This isn't good. In no time at all, she can feel herself drying out. An hour goes by, then another, She's never been out of the water for this long. What are they doing? Don't they understand what she is? Her head starts to feel faint. She slumps down on the floor and turns herself into a ball. Shaped like this, hopefully. She won't be evaporating so fast. Then they'll give her the water back. For hours she sits in a ball, waiting, until mercifully her little tank on wheels returns and she's taken back to her fountain. They do the same to her the next day and the day after that, starving her for hours and returning her to her fountain. They top up the water in it occasionally, but other than that, they don't seem to be doing anything nice for her at all. Are they doing this on purpose? Surely not. She's their friend. She's being kind, doing all of their weird games even when she doesn't want to. Humans aren't cruel, they wouldn't do that to her. But then she finds herself in a different situation entirely. They do the same as they've been doing for the previous few days, wheeling her into the testing chamber and making her stand there on her own. But it's colder today much colder. She tries to explain to them through the glass, rubbing her shoulders and shivering, but they just keep making their notes. This isn't good. She can't stand the cold. It's not good for her. Painful crystals start forming on the surface of her skin, stabbing into her and solidifying her body. She cries out noiselessly, but the humans keep going until she feels herself losing consciousness. Weeks go by. 
and with each experiment they do, the water nymph worries more and more that these humans aren't really her friends. They've started giving her mazes, complex plastic structures that she gets forced unceremoniously into, where she has to swim through various pipes and tubes until she can push a button on the other side. At first, she was expecting a prize. Maybe this is why they had her kept here for so long. They needed help solving these puzzles, and their fleshy bodies couldn't fit through the tubes. But nothing happens when she presses the button. They just pull a plug and drain her out of the bottom. Today, she's had enough. When are they going to put her back in the ocean? She's just going to wait here at the start of the maze until they tell her. It's only fair. The water in her chest leaps for joy as a human enters the test chamber and approaches her. She raises out of the water and waves to greet him, just as he lifts the long, strange device in his hand and jabs it into her chest. The electricity shoots all through her body and sets her mind ablaze. It takes all her strength not to burst into a thousand droplets. Convulsing and crying, she falls backwards into the maze. The human brandishes the weapon at her again. She has nowhere to go but into the maze. She solves it in a split second, but as she presses the button, she feels a sinking feeling settling over her. What if they don't want to let her out? It's all her fault. What was she thinking? Her one shot at making friends, and she'd blown it. She sits crying in her fountain, feeling her tears flow into the water around her and back into her body. It was the acid. She hates acid, and always has. She'd swam near a factory once and got a dose of it. It hurt more than anything she'd ever felt before. It would flow into her chest and sit there, burning and burning. She can still feel it now. So when the humans in the rubber suits had poured some into her fountains, she'd lost her temper, slamming into them with all her force. For months, they have been hurting her, jabbing her and exhausting her. But they're her friends, right? And you shouldn't hurt your friends. You definitely shouldn't kill your friends. You shouldn't rip open their rubber suits and force yourself down their throats, drowning them in their own bodies. Her fountain's red with blood and burns from the acid. And it's all her fault. What had she done wrong to make them treat her like this? Why couldn't they just be friends? After a few weeks, a group of humans come in and clean up the mess, refilling her fountain with clean water. She doesn't lift her head above the surface. They install a pipe above her fountain that drip feeds water onto her. Drip, drip, drip. And just like that, she's no longer seen as human. Drip, drip, drip. The lights burn white. The door stays closed. Drip, drip, drip. The water nymph sits in her fountain. Drip, drip, drip. After a year, she stops crying. A year after that, she gives up on thinking, too. Three years of near silence pass, with only the sound of dripping water from the pipe, until the door to her chamber opens. Something flutters in her chest. She lifts her head out of the water. A friend? It's a quiet day in a small American town. It's warm, with a slight breeze. A calm, simple Sunday, just like so many others. Very few people set their alarms, and most are still asleep at 8 a.m. It's the kind of town where everyone knows and trusts everyone else. After all, what are good neighbors for? While his wife still sleeps back in their modest home, a retired man in his mid-sixties decides to start the day off right. With a rod in one hand and a tackle box in the other, he makes his way down the side of a grassy embankment towards his favorite fishing spot along the local river. He's even got a pair of neatly cut sandwiches in an old-fashioned metal lunch pail, the picture of small-town bliss. But something he sees stops him in his tracks, something large floating in the water. He freezes. He wants to write it off as driftwood or some trash that someone has thrown into the river, but in his heart of hearts, he knows better than that. What's floating in the water is a human corpse. Not long after, the local sheriff's department is on the scene, dredging the body out of the water. It's about as small and underfunded as you can expect for a group of police officers from a place where nothing ever seems to happen. There hadn't been a murder in this quaint little burg in years. When they turn over the body, it isn't hard to make a positive ID. The pallid, water-bloated face of a well-known local man stares up at them with blank, dead eyes. Some in attendance gasp at the sight of it. It had been years since the last murder in town. But when that last murder had occurred, the prime suspect had been this very same man. Ten years prior, he had been a successful local mechanic, but that all changed when his wife turned up dead in a field, her face caved in by some kind of heavy bludgeoning instrument. It was a brutal crime, the most horrific the town had ever seen. Reporters traveled in from all over the state to cover it, 
And that's when the web of secrets tied around this one tragic incident began to truly unravel. It was an open secret in town that the man and his wife weren't exactly on the fondest of terms. He was known for having affairs with women half his age. Rumor had it that his wife was tired of being betrayed and humiliated by her good-for-nothing philandering husband and was finally going to break it off. With the knowledge of his infidelity being so public, she'd take him for all he was worth in divorce court. And it wasn't long after these rumors began that she turned up dead. Soon, fingers were pointed, most of them, naturally, in the man's direction. He lawyered up and denied every charge, but in the court of public opinion, he'd already been convicted. That, however, was the only court he'd ever be convicted in. Despite the wealth of circumstantial evidence, there wasn't enough to convict him of his wife's killing. He was acquitted of all charges and went free, despite his reputation in town taking a severe dive. In the next few years, he'd marry one of his very young mistresses, and the news story would fade away back into the darkness of small-town rumors and hearsay. The murder of his wife would remain forever unsolved. With all the context in mind, the fishermen, a few locals, and the handful of police officers stare down at the dead face of the man, his soaked body sprawled out on the riverbank. A police deputy uses a gloved hand to tilt his head upward slightly, revealing the long, deep wound in his throat, carved so deep it cuts to bone. His throat had been slashed, and whoever had done it had been extremely thorough. The identity of the victim had been confirmed, as had the method of murder. Only one question remained. Who murdered him? Hours later, across town, a man wakes up alone in bed after a long, refreshing sleep. His young wife of five years went downstairs a few hours before to do some chores and cook breakfast, leaving him to his rest. He rubs the sleep from his eyes and yawns. It's a sunny day outside. How wonderful. And he can smell breakfast cooking downstairs. He smiles, gets up, dresses, and makes his way down the stairs at a leisurely pace. He can hear his wife humming in the kitchen. As he passes the threshold, he calls her name, and she freezes up. Her body shakes slightly. Is that fear? He doesn't understand. He steps closer. Suddenly, she turns and screams at him, like he's an intruder wearing a ski mask and holding out a knife. He tells her that it's just him, that everything is fine. He begs her to explain what's going on. Instead, she asks what he's doing in her house and threatens to call the police. He has no idea what's going on. He takes another step forward, and she reacts severely. His young wife grabs the handle of her frying pan and swings it, hitting him as sausages and hot oil fly through the air. He shrieks in a mix of pain, shock, and pure terror before running out of the room. What is happening? Has his wife lost her mind? He needs to get help immediately. He rushes out of his house, but when he reaches the street outside, he finds no safety or comfort, only confused, judgmental stares from his supposed neighbors. They all turn to look at him with the exact same expression as his wife, a look that says, Who are you? As he continues to run, calling for help and fighting back the pain of his oil-scalded skin, he just gets more of those same stares from everyone he encounters. They look at him like he's some kind of raving madman, not someone who'd just been the victim of a random and brutal domestic assault. And yet, back at his home, his wife is already calling the local police to tell them about the stranger who'd just broken into her house and tried to attack her. The sheriff's department deputy on the other end of the line can't believe what he's hearing. A man turns up dead in the local river, and before they can even give his wife the news, she's calling to report that a stranger had tried to attack her in her own home. Could it be any more obvious that this stranger was the one behind her husband's murder? Given that everyone knows everyone in a town like this, it stands to reason that her husband's killer and his wife's home invader must have come from out of town, perhaps a drifter or someone her husband had owed money to. Given the kind of person he was, it was no surprise that he'd burned some kind of bridge badly enough that someone out there would want him dead and act on that desire. Case closed. All that was left to do now was catch this violent madman and bring him to justice before he could hurt anyone else. What kind of justice would they give him, exactly? Well, they could decide on the particulars later. As the man continues his frantic run across town, searching in vain for somebody, anybody to come to his aid, rumors begin to spread through town. After all, in a place where everyone knows everyone, people have a tendency to talk. It doesn't take long for half of the town to hear about the local man who'd been found dead in the river with his throat slashed open, that the same maniac that killed him had made an attempt on his young wife's life, and she just barely managed to fight him off, that the murderer had come in from out of town, and that now he was running through the streets, babbling like a psychopath. It doesn't take long for a consensus to form. It's clear that, if left to his own devices, 
This outsider will only hurt more people. Who will it be next? It could be any of them. The townsfolk feel afraid, upset, unsafe. But most of all, they feel paranoid. The shadow of the maniac seems to be lurking around every corner. If they want to keep themselves safe and avenge the death of the poor man in the river, they'll need to take justice into their own hands. Or this intruder could completely upend their town's quiet life. It's the only way. They unlock their gun safes and arm themselves with shotguns, handguns, and rifles. Those without guns grab bats, hammers, and knives. Some grab shovels and pitchforks from their tool sheds. This loose maniac may be dangerous, but they have numbers on their side. Together, they'll find him and give him what he deserves. The man is still running through the streets, in pain, wondering where everyone has gone. His life is falling apart around him, and he doesn't even know why. Is this all a nightmare? Is he going insane? Before long, he can hear footsteps. People are approaching in groups, yelling, chanting. He sees a crowd turn a nearby corner and stare. Guns, knives, literal pitchforks and torches, wide, bulging eyes and born teeth. Someone points at him and barks, there he is, get him! That's when he realizes that, for some reason, these maniacs have it in for him too. He turns tail and begins to run. He hasn't gone insane, everyone else has. He can hear the thundering of their many footsteps chasing him. He ducks and screams as gunshots ring out, whizzing past him. Some even throw rocks. All these people. This isn't fear, this is pure, undiluted rage. They want to kill him in the street in broad daylight. He hears some of them screaming, Murderer! Murderer will get you! In his terrified mind, he wonders, is this what this is all about? His first wife? He'd been acquitted, it was so many years ago. Why would they all turn on him? Why now? It's... Relief swells and washes over him when he sees a police cruiser making its way towards him from the other end of the street. They'd save him from these bloodthirsty maniacs. The car comes to a stop, and a pair of familiar police officers step out. They seem oddly calm, given the situation. The man approaches, trying to plead with him through a throat racked by pain, exhaustion, and terror. The mob is hot on his heels now. He needs help. He desperately needs help. But as he tries to form the words, he gets a hard lesson in the fact that these police officers are the wrong people to come to for that. The one closest to him slides the baton out of his belt and strikes the man across the face. His face feels a sudden explosion of pain as his cheekbone shatters. Before he can even register what's going on, the other officer strikes the back of his leg with his baton, and he crumbles to the ground. The two of them begin beating him relentlessly while he begs for mercy through broken teeth, and it's not long until the rest of the mob catches up and surrounds him. With a final strike to the face, everything goes black. When he opens his eyes, it's nighttime, and he can feel something constricting his wrists and neck. Heavy ropes cut into his skin. His hands are bound, and there's a noose around his neck, the other end tied to a branch of a tree above him. His feet teeter precariously on a stool below. The rope has no slack. He's surrounded by the townspeople, all armed and staring hatefully at him. The only light comes from their burning torches. The sheriff stands at the front of the crowd, his weeping wife standing next to him. With a stony face, he dictates that, for the crime of murder, he has been found guilty and is sentenced to hang by the neck until he is dead. His eyes widen one last time in pure panic as the sheriff holds up a photo of the dead man pulled from the river. What? No, there must be some kind of terrible mistake. I didn't kill that man. I am that man. I am. I swear. Please. But before he can even form the words, his own wife steps forward and kicks out the stool from under his feet. While this story of fear, paranoia, mob mentality, and unspeakable violence may seem as sadly natural and human as breathing air, the spark that ignited this tinderbox was decidedly inhuman. This is SCP-3852, also known as Small Town Justice. First, meet SCP-3852-1. No matter what your gut feeling may be, I assure you that you do not recognize him. He's an unidentified male corpse, and also an intrinsic factor in the SCP-3852 phenomenon. There are many SCP-3852-1 instances, and all of them are physically and biologically identical. And if ever you encounter one of them, unless the SCP Foundation can intervene in time, something terrible will happen. To put it simply, one of these unidentified corpses will manifest within the bounds of a small town or village typical with a population of over 2,000 people on the East Coast or in the Midwest of the United States. Upon someone seeing the SCP-3852-1 corpse, the SCP-3852 phenomenon will begin. 
Despite having no internal or external injuries in an objective sense, the victims of its anomalous effects will believe that it is a person from their town who has been recently murdered, despite the fact that this victim is very much alive in town. While initially it was believed that the selection of the victim, dubbed SCP-3852-2, was entirely random, as more and more SCP-3852 incidents popped up since the first was recorded in 1978, a pattern began to emerge. It was discovered that the victims were all people who were believed to have committed some serious or repeated crimes in the past, but who were acquitted or otherwise cleared of charges. But when the phenomenon begins, a frightening switch occurs. While the body will take on the identity of the victim for a number of the township's citizens, the actual victim will become a depersonalized stranger, an outsider, someone to be looked upon with active suspicion that soon grows into paranoia and, eventually, uncontrollable rage and bloodlust. But the fury of the mob being directed at one person is one thing, a town being dragged into what seems like an outright civil war is quite another. The mob will arm themselves and go on the hunt for the accused. During the process, if anyone in town attempts to stop them, such as when individuals try to stand up on behalf of the accused encouraging the mob to exercise caution and approach the situation rationally, as happens in many SCP-3852 events, they too will become perceived differently. It is estimated that between 11 and 27 percent of the affected community will not be swayed to join the vigilante group, and when they refute the accusations, they will be accused of trying to impede the course of justice. When the violence eventually breaks out though, as it always does, they will not be spared. When the victim that started it all is finally found, they will be violently executed, at which point the townsfolk will all begin behaving normally and life will resume once more as if nothing ever happened. In the aftermath, people will give inconsistent accounts of what occurred, but none will experience any long-term traumatic effects from taking part in or witnessing the violence. Since the phenomenon was first noted back in 1978, the SCP Foundation has recorded 16 different SCP-3852 incidents, some of which have been appended to the official files for expository purposes. One such event, labeled EV-3852-07F3T, is the very first that the Foundation encountered. During this 3852 event, which occurred in a small town in Indiana, 368 people were brought under the thrall of the anomaly's effects when the SCP-3852-1 body was encountered in the town square just after sunrise and was identified as belonging to a 28-year-old local unemployed man named Glenn. It didn't take long for the citizens to turn on the still-living Glenn, causing the poor young man to try and flee from the hundreds of people baying for his blood. He was eventually overtaken by the townsfolk while trying to cross a river and escape from the town. He was pulled from the river and beaten viciously. He was then dragged back into the town square and hanged for his perceived crime of murdering himself. The SCP Foundation managed to recover the anomalous SCP-3852-1 corpse before questioning the remaining townsfolk and administering amnestics. An even worse event occurred 18 years later in Ohio, recorded as EV-3852-15C1K. This time, 572 people were affected by SCP-3852 when the body of a controversial local man named Hector was discovered in a nearby schoolyard. Hector was a former factory worker until he was involved in a drunk driving incident which resulted in another driver dying and left Hector paralyzed from the waist down. When the body was found, suspicion of course immediately fell upon the real Hector for the crime. When roughly 23% of the community objected to these accusations, they also became targets of the violent mob intent on taking Hector's life out of their twisted sense of justice. When later interviewing one of the mob's ringleaders, a 52-year-old named Matthew Escott, the Foundation discovered that neither him nor any of the other mob members noticed the strange coincidence that Hector's killer was also a paraplegic man of about the same size and build as Hector. As predicted, nobody involved seemed to carry any guilt or even full awareness of what they'd carried out in pursuit of justice. Hector and those who were attempting to defend him were chased into an abandoned barn on the edge of town for a final standoff. The mob dragged out Hector and his defenders and brutally murdered them all. MTF Epsilon 6, also known as the Village Idiots, a group specializing in small town anomalies, was called in to retrieve the SCP-3852-1 body and clean up the mess in the aftermath. Incidentally, a video of the carnage was somehow leaked onto the video sharing website YouTube some years later, causing a containment fiasco for the Foundation. The investigation into the cameraman who filmed and presumably uploaded the video is ongoing 
and any information you may have into their identity should be reported to the nearest Foundation agent so that they can be properly terminated debriefed. SCP-3852 is an incredibly insidious anomaly, because even in the most desirable scenario possible, at least one person is doomed to die. In order for the town to be pacified and released from the anomalous effects of SCP-3852, the victim designated SCP-3852-2 must be neutralized. There simply appears to be no other way. When the village idiots are dispatched to a town in the thrall of SCP-3852, they are under strict instructions to execute the SCP-3852-2 individual as quickly as possible and distribute amnestics in order to avoid any additional or unnecessary bloodshed before collecting the SCP-3852-1 body and bringing it back for containment with the others at a secure Foundation site. Naturally, the SCP Foundation remains on the lookout for strange, hostile activity arising in small towns for fear that it could be another SCP-3852 incident unfolding. There is no way of predicting where the anomaly will strike next, given that anywhere with a population over 2,000 on the East Coast or in the Midwest is vulnerable to its influence. As such, it has been given the Keter class to reflect the challenges it poses to reliable containment. The fact that SCP-3852 seems to attack people with some prior history of accused crime does nothing to narrow down this roster either. After all, every small town, no matter how idyllic, holds dark secrets. SCP-3852 just provides a way to bring those secrets into the light. A teenaged boy and girl are sitting on surfboards, gently bobbing up and down in the calm ocean water. This surfing trip didn't turn out nearly as exciting as they had hoped it would. So with no waves in sight and the pair growing bored, they decide to head back to shore. Just as they're about to start paddling back though, the girl gives one last look and spots the water swelling in the distance. She calls out for her friend to stop, it's just what they've been waiting for. Waves are coming in, and big ones too. They can see that they're going to break at the perfect time, maybe this trip will turn out to be a good one after all. The boy tells the girl that she can have the first one, and she starts paddling to catch it. She pops up on her board just as the wave breaks, riding it expertly towards the shore, as the boy does the same on his own behind her. They have a great time, riding wave after wave, each one coming in bigger and stronger than the last. The girl starts to worry though that they might be getting too big and fast. As the girl finishes surfing another perfect wave, she looks back at the boy just in time to see him wipe out on an especially tall one. He and his board are pulled beneath the water and both disappear under the breaking wave. She hops off her own board and stands in the waist-deep water, watching for her friend to emerge. But he doesn't. She scans the horizon and calls out for him, but there's no sign of her friend. She's getting worried. He should have surfaced by now. She doesn't see any sign of him or his board. What's going on? Boo! The girl jumps with fright and turns around. The boy is standing behind her. But how did he get there? He tells her that the last wave was a crazy one that must have pulled him and his board under the water towards her. He's never experienced anything quite like it, but he's fine now, there's nothing to worry about. The girl, still trying to catch her breath from the fright, gives him a playful punch on the arm and recommends that they call it a day. The waves are getting stronger, and if he was pulled under once, then who knows what would happen if one of them wiped out on an even bigger one. Besides, the boy looks like he might have hurt himself, and the girl points at a small cut on his arm that's starting to bleed. The boy tells her that it's only a scratch, and insists on catching one more wave before they head home. He doesn't want to miss this opportunity to ride these great waves when they have the whole ocean to themselves. He tells her that she can head back if she wants, but he's going out one more time. The boy starts to paddle back out, and the girl reluctantly follows him. As they wait to catch a wave, she tells him that this time he can go first. She's not going to let him scare her again. The boy promises no more surprises, and goes to catch another wave. The waves are coming faster now, and she's able to get on one right behind him. As she surfs towards the shore, she keeps one eye on the boy. These waves are tough, and she needs to focus, but her attention is drawn towards her friend. She sees something forming on his wave. It looks like the water itself is growing out of the crest of the wave and reaching towards the boy. It looks like the jaws of a shark. The girl screams, and the boy looks back, straight into the gnashing teeth of the shark reaching out of the waves. The boy yells in fear and falls, tumbling into the water just underneath the mouth as its jaws snap shut on his board right where he was standing, splintering it into pieces. The girl can't believe what she's seeing and stumbles on her board. 
She catches herself but looks behind her just in time to see the same jaws coming out of the wave towards her. The boy emerges out of the water carrying his friend onto the nearly empty beach. He lays her down in the sand, screaming for help as a few beachgoers start running towards them. No one has any idea what they could possibly do to assist, though. Both of the girl's legs have been bitten off at the thigh, and it's clear she was dead long before he carried her onto the beach. Bonjour! Today's file comes from our friends at the French branch of the SCP Foundation, a frightening and dangerous aquatic anomaly that has been designated SCP-054-FR, but is appropriately also known as Blue Fear. SCP-054-FR is an oceanic phenomenon that has been observed occurring in several different regions spread across the world. In these areas, of which at least five have been identified, certain waves will display extremely dangerous anomalous activity. The waves themselves will seem to physically transform, taking on a shape that resembles the mouth and jaws of a Carcharidon carcarius, a species of shark better known to most as the Great White. The giant shark mouth, which is full of row upon row of razor-sharp teeth, will often go unnoticed until it is too late for the unfortunate victim, with the roar of the powerful wave itself covering up much of the sound of the gnashing jaws as it attempts to bite the targeted individual. The SCP-054-FR phenomenon will only appear on waves in these areas that are at least 4 meters in height, but a maximum height on which the jaws will manifest has yet to be identified. Waves carrying the anomalous effect are changed in other ways, too. Not only does a terrifying set of carnivorous jaws appear out of the water, but the wave will move faster as well. With SCP-054-FR waves having been measured at rolling three times the speed of normal, non-affected waves. The frequency of just how often SCP-054-FR will affect waves is not well understood, but what is known is that waves will speed up when a human or non-aquatic animal is in the water between a wave instance and the coast. The frequency of 054-FR waves will increase dramatically as well when individuals in the area are at least 250 meters from the coast, and SCP-054-FR does not care which aquatic activities you're engaging in when it spots you that far from shore. There have been documented cases involving casual swimmers, snorkelers, and divers, but surfers are, for some unknown reason, far and away the most likely victims. Observations have shown that non-aquatic animals are also at risk of triggering the effect, such as in the case of several seabirds that were seen floating on the water just before an SCP-054-FR wave crashed down on them and the birds vanished, leaving only blood and feathers floating on the surface where they once were. Even some aquatic vehicles like jet skis and small boats have been observed being attacked by the anomalous shark jaws, though it seems to avoid going after larger vessels. If more than one person is present in the area that SCP-054-FR is manifesting, though, then additional instances of the jaws are able to form, either on the same wave or on multiple different ones in the area. The injuries caused by SCP-054-FR are very similar to those of a normal, non-anomalous great white shark, and the force of the jaws appears to be proportional to the size of the wave itself, with larger waves being more powerful than smaller ones. Victims of 054-FR attacks have had entire limbs ripped off, others were torn completely in half, while some simply disappeared beneath the wave as it crashed down on top of them and the jaws snapped shut. The only way to avoid being bitten or swallowed whole is to dive down under the wave before it impacts, but the opportunity to do so is quite rare given the wave's ability to sneak up on its victims, and the injuries that are nearly always sustained from an appearance of SCP-054-FR are fatal in 68% of recorded cases. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-054-FR following multiple reports of shark attacks caused by Great Whites emerging out of the waves to attack humans before vanishing back into the water, and the Foundation soon began a series of experiments to try and better understand the anomaly. The first test performed by Foundation researchers was quite straightforward and involved dumping large quantities of animal blood into the water in an area where SCP-054-FR was reported to have been attacking people. Just like with a normal shark, the blood seemed to act as a trigger for the anomaly, causing it to manifest in less than two minutes, and the researchers watched as the shark jaws tried to bite at the blood as the wave rolled over it. The test was repeated, but this time human blood was used instead. This also caused instances of SCP-054-FR to appear on the waves, though now they manifested much faster, often showing up less than one minute after the blood was dumped into the water. 
It seems that SCP-054-FR has a strong preference for humans, or at least their blood, and only a small amount is all that is needed to cause the shark jaws to quickly appear. Tests involving D-Class personnel have shown that wounded individuals are four times as likely to trigger a manifestation as an uninjured individual, but that there are also ways to limit how often the carnivorous waves will appear. It seems that lying motionless on the water will significantly reduce how often SCP-054-FR will spawn, and slow body movements will decrease the likelihood of an appearance as well. Strangely, while blood will make the jaws manifest quickly, it is unlikely that it is because SCP-054-FR can smell it, since tests that have tried to disguise the smell of both the blood and the human test subjects have all met with failure. So far, all attempts at damaging the anomaly have also been unsuccessful. Bullets fired at the shark jaws pass harmlessly through it, disappearing into the wave as if they were shooting at perfectly normal water. Given its nature, it seems unlikely that the Foundation will find a way to capture and contain SCP-054-FR, so for the time being, all containment efforts have been directed towards keeping humans away from it. A one-kilometer exclusion zone has been established around the five geographic areas where manifestations have been reported, and civilians are completely forbidden to access the areas, under the guise of there being ongoing research into marine mammal life that would be disrupted by the presence of any humans. Secrecy is of the utmost importance when it comes to SCP-054-FR in order to keep the curious away for their own safety, so any photographic evidence of the anomaly is confiscated and destroyed and witnesses of an SCP-054-FR attack are given amnestics in order to remove the memory of any anomalous shark attacks from their minds. The Foundation also engages in an extensive misinformation campaign to debunk any evidence of the anomaly, spreading the idea that any reports of a shark mouth forming on waves are simply hoaxes or misunderstanding of wave dynamics, while attacks are blamed on normal, non-anomalous great white sharks. It is unknown if the five areas the Foundation has contained make up the entirety of the locations where SCP-054-FR can manifest, but Foundation agents continue to monitor reports of shark attacks around the world, and hopefully, they will find that they were the result of the regular oceanic superpredator, and not the kind that can manifest behind you when you least expect it. Two recreational divers are swimming along the seafloor nearly a hundred feet below the surface. This husband and wife duo are no strangers to scuba diving and they move effortlessly through the water as they marvel at the various fish and plant life that normally remain unseen by humans. The woman taps her husband on the shoulder and points in the direction of a forest of kelp before starting to swim towards it. The man is about to follow when he sees something out of the corner of his eye. He stops and turns to get a better look. A few dozen meters away is a group of people. The man is confused. He looks back towards his wife, who is motioning for him to follow her. He raises a single finger as if to say, I'll be with you in a minute, and starts to swim in the direction of the strange crowd of people standing on the seafloor. He still can't make out exactly what he's looking at. A light current is causing silt to kick up and hang in the air, obscuring his view. As he gets closer though, everything becomes clear. It really is a group of people, standing perfectly still, 30 meters underwater. But they aren't living people, of course. They are statues. The man can see now that these are statues of children. They are standing in a circle, facing outwards, and each one is holding hands with the statues next to them, forming an unbroken ring. He swims closer to get a better look. The statues are covered in algae and other plant life. He doesn't know who or why someone would make this strange art piece, but whatever their reasons, it looks like it's been down here a long time. He swims around the circle and counts more than 20 in total, with each one looking to be unique. While the center of the circle of statues is empty, there's pieces of bricks and concrete scattered all around it. There used to be something down here, a building or some kind of structure that once housed the statues and has now collapsed. It seems impossible that anything could have ever been built down here. He looks back in the direction of his wife, but he can't see her. She must be somewhere along the kelp investigating her own mysteries. He's about to head in her direction when he notices something. The inside of the circle isn't empty. Something is inside, sticking out of the sand. He swims up above the ring to get a better look. There's definitely something buried in the circle of statues. He can see now that it is the corner of what looks to be a metal box. He swims down closer to the box and reaches a hand out towards it, when he suddenly stops and looks up. The woman swims out of the dense kelp forest carrying a brightly colored shell. She can't wait to show her husband how beautiful it is. She looks around but there's no sign of him. She looks in the direction that he swam and spots the same strange group of people that he did. 
As she swims towards them, she also quickly realizes that these are just statues. Very odd ones, but statues nonetheless. She also notices the rubble that surrounds them. The broken chunks of concrete, bricks, some bones… wait, bones? That's when she spots something else lying on the ocean floor just outside the ring of statues. It's her husband's scuba tank, with his shattered mask resting on top. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-1451, also known as Sunken Children's Perimeter. SCP-1451 is the designation that has been given to an anomalous set of metal statues that possess very strange and deadly properties. The 26 statues, each of which is unique and have been given the designations SCP-1451-1 through 26, all resemble human children and range in height from 1.32 to 1.43 meters. They are located within an ocean inlet on the seafloor and are arranged in a circle facing outwards, with each holding hands with the ones next to it, forming an unbroken ring. These statues are anything but stationary though, at least some of the time, and in fact they have three distinct stages of motion, which the SCP Foundation refers to as Class 1 through 3 scenarios. The first, a Class 1 scenario, is the designation given when no movement is detected at all. This is the state that the statues appear to spend the majority of their time in. The designation will change to Class 2 when some slight movement of the statues is detected. In this state, they can be seen to slowly raise and lower their hands, while also subtly moving together in a counterclockwise direction. Bubbles have been observed coming from the statues' mouths during this scenario. SCP-1451 will be seen to behave this way when a large object comes near it, and it will often mean that the statues are preparing to transition into a Class 3 scenario. A Class 3 scenario will be triggered when a solid object that weighs more than 40 grams enters the center of the circle. When the object, whether it be a living one or not, enters this activation area, the statues will fully animate and turn their attention on the object with only one purpose, to destroy it. When the statues enter a Class 3 scenario, they exhibit incredible strength and agility. They appear to possess at least a rudimentary form of intelligence as well, as they have been seen utilizing teamwork and advanced tactics. Once the statues have been activated, they are relentless in the pursuit of their targets, stopping at nothing to neutralize them. Should you manage to make it out of the activation area, the statues will still continue to give chase, and in one case, they followed a target over a kilometer before finally overtaking it. Once they get their hands on a target, death and destruction are all but assured. They will rip and tear anything that enters their circle apart, be it man or machine, with their metallic hands. Once they have eliminated the object, the statues will then return to their Class 1 scenario position. Attempts to intercept the statues as they return to their activation area will lead to what the Foundation has dubbed the Class 3.5 scenario, during which they will destroy anyone or anything that tries to intervene or prevent them from reaching their destination. While SCP-1451 might seem to be one of the simpler anomalies in the SCP Foundation database, there may just be more to this story than first meets the eye, and in fact, the sunken children's perimeter may not even be the first anomaly that was contained here. Those with Foundation Overseer level clearance have access to some rather interesting documents that help to fill in just what SCP-1451 might really be, and more importantly, what they're protecting. The documents include a manifest of the materials that were initially recovered from the area where SCP-1451 was discovered. These materials included roughly 20 kilograms of bricks, 4,000 kilograms of containment grade concrete, the type normally used in SCP Foundation sites, and most interesting of all, a damaged Scranton box. For those unaware, Scranton boxes were the precursors to Dr. Scranton's much better known reality anchors. These powerful devices are used to contain reality warping anomalies and prevent them from bending the fabric of our universe to their whims. Dr. Scranton's initial research into the technology produced an early version that was used in the containment of anomalies, though we now know that the technology was flawed and could lead to failures in containment. In the case of SCP-1451, a document was partially recovered from the Scranton box that alludes to just such a failure. In this instance, a powerful Euclid-class reality warper was being held at Area 56, a location that the Foundation has no record of ever having existed. The corrupted file seems to suggest that the reality warping SCP's primary anomalous attribute was that things it believed to be real would become real. If it misconceived reality in any way, its anomalous abilities would force that misconception to become actual reality. 
For example, after the anomalous entity referred to an agent assigned to its containment as a child, the agent was at risk of undergoing various physical and mental changes to truly become a child. It appears that the anomaly may have begun conflating various aspects of its containment, mixing up the concepts of containment itself. The metal of its cage, the concrete of its cell, the child agent involved with its containment, the SCP Foundation itself, they all became entangled within the reality warping anomaly's mind and appear to have been jumbled together in such a way that led to the creation of SCP-1451, a group of metal children who are eternally on guard and destroy anything that tries to breach their perimeter. Just what happened to Area 56, the personnel who were stationed there, or the powerful reality-warping anomaly they contained, continues to be a mystery. SCP-1451 has been classified as Euclid and is considered to be effectively contained at its current location. A sphere of wire mesh netting has been erected around it in order to ensure that no objects enter its activation area, but in the event that an object does manage to enter the circle, the statues are to be remotely monitored and no attempts whatsoever are to be made to try and rescue the person or object that triggered the Class 3 scenario. A violent storm rocks a merchant ship back and forth. Huge waves roll over the deck and threaten to capsize the vessel. A merchant sailor grips the railing, trying with all his might not to be thrown overboard. With a loud twang, a cable snaps loose. A hand suddenly grabs his shoulder. He turns around with a fright to see that it's one of his shipmates. He points towards the bow of the ship and yells over the roar of the storm that they need to try and repair it. The two men make their way to the front of the ship and the sailor starts working to fix the broken cable. He looks up to see that his mate is no longer working. He's staring straight past him, and there's fear in his eyes. The sailor turns around to see a massive tentacle sticking out of the sea. The huge appendage is mind-boggling in its size. He can only stand there, marveling at it, until it begins violently smashing against the deck. The sailor dives out of the way just before the tentacle crashes down right where he was standing where his crewmate was still locked in fear. The ship is in chaos as more tentacles appear and slam the deck over and over. One cracks the deck right next to him, sending him flying. He comes to moments later in a wreckage pile. Nothing else has changed, though. Whatever this monster is, it's not stopping its assault on the ship. The sailor stands up and picks up a sharpened piece of wood from the pile he was lying in. He runs over to the nearest tentacle and thrusts the sharpened stick into its flesh. There's a mighty roar from the sea, and the tentacles stop their onslaught. They go limp before sliding into the sea. The sailor looks around at the carnage that's been wrought. Dead bodies and debris litter the deck. He moves to check on his crewmates, when right in front of him, bursting from the sea, is the head of the biggest squid he has ever seen a massive beast that must be a thousand meters long. Whatever he had seen before of this creature was truly just the tip of the iceberg. With another roar, the creature lifts up out of the water and wraps its arms around the ship. The sailor only has time to duck down and close his eyes before the entire ship is pulled down beneath the waves. With a gasp, the sailor breaks the surface, screaming and gulping for air. He's alone now treading water in the middle of the ocean during a storm, but not for long. The squid reappears, its head slowly rising out of the water just in front of him. Its head, the size of a house, has two giant, uncaring black eyes that seem to both see him and not. It extends a tentacle toward him as it leans back in the water, exposing its huge, beaked mouth. It wraps its powerful arms around him and starts to pull him towards it, when suddenly, there's an explosion. The squid has been struck by something. Both the sailor and the creature turn to see the most incredible thing. A battleship is coming towards them, slowly rising out of the ocean as if it were somehow submerged, and it's firing on the creature. The squid drops him and starts heading towards the ship. This is going to be a battle for the ages. While this sailor had no idea what he was witnessing, the SCP Foundation was all too familiar. This was yet another incident of SCP-2846, also known as The Squid and the Sailor. But first, a quick personal request from me. I need your help to spread the word about the lesser-known anomalies in the SCP Foundation's archives. The best thing you can do to help me is subscribe, turn on notifications, and then go tell your friends to do the same. 
This is a huge help and will let me bring you more and more SCP anomalies. Now back to our file. SCP-2846 is the name given to a set of phenomena that occur in the Gulf Atlantic region. These phenomena consist of interactions between two entities, known as SCP-2846-A and SCP-2846-B. 2846-A is a gigantic, aquatic creature that resembles a cephalopod, though no similar organism has been discovered that is even close to approaching its size, with estimates placing 2846-A at being at least 950 meters in length. This creature appears in areas of deep water during storms and will attack civilian vessels, especially cruise ships and merchant vessels. These attacks are sporadic and follow no known patterns other than that they take place during inclement weather. They are sudden and without warning and will nearly always result in the complete destruction of the targeted vessel if they're not intercepted. Attempting to stop these attacks is SCP-2846-B, a large seafaring vessel that in its current form resembles a Pennsylvania-class super dreadnought battleship, though it appears hazy in photos and videos as if translucent, and eyewitness observers have described the ship as looking vaporous. Just like SCP-2846-A, this ship will appear from deep water, surfacing near the site of a 2846-A event. The vessel will fire on the creature, drawing its attention, and the two will then engage in a heated battle. The two will continue fighting until SCP-2846-A is rendered immobile or completely incapacitated, after which it will sink down into the sea. Following its victory, the ship too will then submerge and disappear beneath the waves. SCP-2846-A is believed to have existed for thousands of years, and maybe even older than that. The creature's existence was first recorded in an Icelandic saga from the 13th century, but the Foundation's first documented sighting came in 1905, when an agent working for the Foundation, one Admiral Reginald von Allen, spotted the creature surfacing with a whale wrapped effortlessly in its tentacles. Soon after spotting it, a ship of the line surfaced as well to do battle with the creature. The Admiral tried to signal the crew that he could see on the deck of the ship, but the vessel descended back below the surface before any communication could take place. In 1935, the mysterious ship appeared again, near the SCPS Hildegard, and this time, the anomalous vessel was the one to initiate communication. Some of the crew of the ship, designated as SCP-2846-B1 through B915, came aboard the Foundation ship and engaged in a conversation with Captain Levy Hansen. SCP-2846-B1 identified himself as David Thomas Jones of the Royal Navy and went on to explain that their ship had been sunk by a monster resembling SCP-2846-A over 300 years in the past. He described how after sinking into the darkness of the sea, he awoke on a mysterious shore where he met with a woman who referred to herself as Calypso, the goddess of the sea. She explained how she had sealed the leviathans that prowled the depths of the ocean in a pit, but that over time, the seal she had placed on it had begun to weaken. A titan had escaped and taken the form of the most deadly creature in the sea, the Kraken. Calypso feared that the creature would attempt to further destroy the seal and release its monstrous brethren, a disaster that would result in the end of all human life. She requested that Jones pursue the creature along with his crew for as long as needed, and in return, they would be granted immortality. Jones agreed, and his endless battle against the anomaly began that day. The reason he had now come aboard a Foundation ship was directly related to this task. SCP-2846-A had grown more powerful over the years, larger and bolder too. He and his men couldn't die, but many more would if they were no longer able to subdue the beast. He needed something from the SCP Foundation. He needed a bigger boat. Following this conversation and seeing the value in allowing Jones and his crew to continue their mission, the Foundation commandeered a newly built Pennsylvania-class super dreadnought battleship from the US Navy, the USS Montana. The ship was sunk 15 kilometers from a Foundation naval facility in Cuba. 30 hours later, the ship surfaced from the sea, though it was now more heavily armed than the USS Montana had been. As part of the agreement, SCP-2846-B was fitted with an explosive device that is capable of completely destroying the ship should the crew for some reason ever turn their guns on Foundation or other human targets. In 2013, an important discovery was made after a tracker was attached to SCP-2846-A. Deep in the Atlantic, roughly 1,300 nautical miles west of Florida, a depression in the ocean floor with a large iron object on top of it was found. 
2846 seems to return to this site over and over, where it has been observed clearing the rocks from the area. And it appears that it is almost finished with its task. The iron plate on top of the depression is nearly exposed. It's not known exactly what's underneath, but whatever it is, it's hot. Very hot, with temperatures near it measured at over 4,000 degrees Celsius. It's feared that whatever the creature is trying to unearth, it would lead to an XK end-of-the-world scenario, and it is imperative that it not be allowed to do so. And there's more bad news when it comes to SCP-2846. In 2014, the Foundation ship SCPS Pristine was pursuing a large underwater organism assumed to be SCP-2846-A, and signaled to 2846-B to surface and dispatch the creature in what had become the normal operating procedure. Something strange happened, though and the pristine was suddenly struck by a mysterious force. As SCP-2846-B began to engage with the now-surfaced 2846-A, the crew of the pristine reported seeing numerous eyes appearing and disappearing in the water below the ship. They had never seen anything like it. The ship was struck again, as satellite images spotted an enormous entity directly beneath the ship. The pristine began taking on water, and the crew was forced to abandon ship. Two other SCP ships in the area fired on the strange, many-eyed entity, causing it to once again disappear into the depths of the ocean, as SCP-2846-B banished 2846-A to the ocean once again. Due to the ongoing danger of SCP-2846-A, it has been classified as Keter. In the event of an appearance, Mobile Task Force Tau-11, also known as the Can Openers, who are stationed aboard the SCPS Nikolai, are to utilize a special transmission device to signal the crew of SCP-2846-B and maintain contact with them throughout their engagement with the creature. Tau-11's primary mission is to minimize civilian exposure to the anomaly, and any non-Foundation ships that come in contact with either 2846 entity are to be moved from the area, and all aboard the craft are to be given Class C amnestics. The SCPS Nikolai's captain has been given permission to fire on SCP-2846-A to assist in the fight, and should 2846-B turn hostile for any reason, the explosive device on board is to be detonated. It is still unknown just what the entity that attacked and destroyed the SCPS Pristine was, but the ease with which it dispensed of the vessel has many in the Foundation worried that SCP-2846-A has already been able to release one of its brethren from its prison, and at this point, stopping them may no longer be an option. At first glance, it looks like a perfectly ordinary bathroom. Nothing to suggest that anything weird is going on here. Certainly, if the D-Class personnel assigned to investigate this facility had encountered this room in the wild, if you walked into a bathroom that looked like this while visiting a friend's house or lunching in a restaurant or even stopping at a gas station rest stop, he wouldn't have any reason to think anything was amiss. But this is the SCP Foundation, so he knows that nothing here is as it seems. He glances briefly up at the camera installed in the ceiling. The lens aperture dilates briefly, focusing on his face, and he knows that an SCP technical on the other end is watching his every move. He grimaces, fully aware that his status as a member of D-Class personnel means that every experiment could be his last. That knowledge doesn't exactly endear him to the Foundation or its mission, but it's not like he has much of a choice in picking his assignments. Suddenly, a voice crackles to life over the intercom. Please step fully into the bathroom, says the researcher on the other end of the camera feed. What's this all about? asks the D-Class personnel. This is just a bathroom, isn't it? What's so special about this place? His eyes scan the room. The floor is covered with smooth white tiles. The walls are a soothing light blue color, reminiscent of a calm ocean, the sort of color that you might pick for its soothing effect when you need to make use of these facilities. A large mirror is fixed to the wall before a countertop with a sink. Next to the sink, there's a toilet. And next to that, a bathtub with a shower. There's a scrubbing brush and a plunger stashed behind the toilet tank, and a fuzzy shag cover stretched over the toilet lid. It's all very ordinary. It's much too ordinary, he thinks. A sudden horrible thought occurs to him. You're not going to watch me use the toilet, he asks, a slight edge of panic in his voice. That's absurd, of course, but here at the SCP Foundation, there's nothing that he would put past these people. They've always got some new weirdness happening and it wouldn't at all surprise him to learn that they would want to watch him at his most exposed. The voice comes back over the intercom. What? No, you don't need to use that. Look, just step forward. Literally all that I want you to do is to step into the room. 
The D-Class smirks to himself. He's already been through more of these crazy experiments than he would care to remember, and he has the scars to prove it. It gives him a small measure of satisfaction to hear the agent getting flustered. Even if he has to participate in these dangerous experiments, he can at least make things awkward for his tormentors. That seems like a little bit of poetic justice to him. As the agent requested, though, he steps forward. The moment that he's cleared the threshold, the door slams behind him with a crash. The D-Class jumps in surprise and shouts, What the? Why'd you do that? I didn't do that, says the voice over the intercom. Of course, thinks the D-Class personnel. He should have expected this. He grabs the doorknob and tries to yank the door open, but the door is stuck fast. He yanks again, harder this time, but the result is the same. The door doesn't budge at all. The door's stuck, cries the D-Class. He feels his heart start to beat faster and his temperature begins to rise. What terrible thing does this room plan to do to him? But after a moment, he begins to calm down. It doesn't seem like this room is planning to do anything. Maybe it's just a room with a weird door. But if that were the case, then why would the SCP Foundation be interested in this? Just hang tight, says the agent. I'll see what I can do about getting that door open. A few moments later, the agent arrives at the door to the bathroom and gives it a sharp yank. It doesn't budge. Door's stuck, she says. The D-Class rolls his eyes. Of course it's stuck. Hold on a second, I'll go get a technician, she says. The D-Class personnel listens to the sound of the agent's feet retreating into the distance. He sits down on the closed toilet and buries his face in his hands. What a day. Is he going to be trapped inside this bathroom forever? He can't help but speculate, but he tries not to think about it. He's more annoyed than anything, truth be told. He wonders if the agent is actually going for help or if she's still just sitting in her cubicle, watching him through the camera and waiting for the other shoe to drop. His eyes flick to the camera and he furrows his brow. He's so intent on the camera that he doesn't notice as a dark shape slowly bubbles out from the bathtub drain. It's a cockroach, a perfectly ordinary cockroach. Or is it? The roach remains motionless for a moment, perfectly still, except for the subtle twitch of its antenna. Then, all at once, it starts to move. The roach scuttles across the tub, scaling the porcelain walls, and runs across the counter. Like all cockroaches, it seems confused now that it's emerged into the light and eager to find a dark corner where it can hide again. It reaches the edge of the countertop, but, of course, a sheer cliff is no obstacle for an insect. It shimmies down the cabinet and makes a dash across the tiled floor. That's when the moving roach finally catches the eye of the D-Class personnel. He yelps in surprise and pulls his feet up, his knees going flush with his chest. The roach looks oddly out of place in this clean and well-maintained bathroom, and the sight of this disgusting little vermin fills the D-Class with a sudden and deep sense of loathing. That's one massive cockroach, he mumbles to himself. Almost as if it heard his words, the roach starts to skitter toward him. The D-Class does not like that at all. Without hesitation, he immediately stomps on the roach, bringing his foot down with a definite thud and then grinding the unfortunate insect under his heel. The sound is loud enough to attract the attention of the agent behind the camera. Apparently, she must have returned to her post after sending a request for a technician. What was that? She asks, her voice crackling over the intercom. There was a really huge cockroach, just came out of the tub. Come on, hurry up and get the door open. I don't like it in here. There might be more of them. Okay, okay, says the agent. Just hold on for a second. Help will be here in just a couple minutes. Don't be so jumpy, it's just a bug after all, nothing to worry about. The D-Class personnel isn't so sure of that. After all, when you're dealing with unknown anomalies like those in the SCP archives, can you ever just not worry? He pulls his shoe off, stands up from the toilet, and walks over to the sink. Grumbling to himself, he turns the faucet and starts to wash the insect icor off the bottom of his shoe. He's too intent on his activity to notice that a second cockroach has already popped out of the bathtub drain. Like the first one, it hesitates for a moment, and then it scuttles across the tub, scales the walls, and makes a beeline for its deceased comrade. As this happens, a third roach emerges from the drain, and a fourth. By the time the D-Class turns around, a whole battalion of cockroaches has entered the bathroom. His eyes go wide as he takes in the scene. A good dozen roaches have clustered around the first smashed roach, all feeding on its carcass. It's a grisly scene, and the D-Class is immediately revolted. He knows nothing about roaches, nothing that might suggest to him that this is in any way unusual behavior for these insects, but he doesn't really care. It looks disgusting, and he's positive that it isn't natural. I don't like this, I don't like this, he yells, panic rising in his voice. Get me out of here! Hurry up and open the stupid door! The observing agent, safe in her office, doesn't share the D-Class personnel's terror. From her point of view, she's just watching a man freak out over a couple of perfectly ordinary bugs. 
Of course, the scene takes on a whole different feel when you're not the one being asked to expose yourself to strange and potentially dangerous SCPs. She can't help but chuckle at the scene. It's not funny! cries the D-Class, once again jumping on the toilet and pulling up his legs into a fetal position. Those things are huge! You better get me out of here now, or… 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 He struggles to think of some threat that might convince the agent to take him seriously, but he fails. The agent is too busy taking notes on the situation. The roaches look to be ordinary specimens of the American cockroach, each about five or six centimeters long. When the group of roaches has devoured their smashed comrade, that's when things start to get really strange. The small group turns as one toward the D-Class. Now that is weird, thinks the agent. The D-Class probably thinks the same, because he starts to scream incoherently. Both Agent and D-Class are so focused on the roaches that they don't notice something even more sinister happening in the bathtub. A dark, tar-like substance has started to seep out of the drain, gradually filling the bathtub. The Agent is too busy trying to soothe the D-Class, trying to convince him to stop screaming and start explaining the scene to her in rational detail so that she can add his observations to her notes. Meanwhile, the oily black tar continues to bubble from the drain, the surface level rising, until the tub is approximately one-fifth full of black goo. The D-Class's eyes suddenly alight on the tub. What the… What, what's this? He mutters. Suddenly, dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds, of roaches start to rise from the black goo. They boil over the sides of the tub in massive chitinous waves, spreading across the floor of the bathroom in a solid sheet of glimmering black carapaces. It happens so fast that the D-Class can only gibber in mindless terror. There are too many roaches. For the moment, the D-Class seems safe perched on the toilet. The roaches can't scale up the shiny porcelain, slipping back down at every attempt. He scrambles to his feet, standing on top of the toilet lid and praying that it will hold his full weight. Otherwise, he's going to tumble head first into that writhing, seething swarm of vermin. He stares at what looks like an ocean of living insects, the light reflecting off their chitinous shells with an evil oily gleam. It's like a scene out of a cheesy horror movie, but it's all too real. Through his panic, the D-Class vaguely recalls that when he was a kid, he once read a book about ancient life on Earth during the Permian era, when the Earth was a hot, humid jungle, when high temperatures and oxygen-rich air made the world perfect for giant insects. Cockroaches have lived on this Earth for how many million years, he wonders. He knows it's a lot, and he can't help but think about that legacy now that he's confronted with a living carpet made entirely out of roaches. Aren't scientists always predicting that cockroaches will eventually outlive humanity? They're the only nasty little things tenacious enough to survive a nuclear holocaust or the punishments of climate change. He's less worried that cockroaches will outlive humanity right now, though, and more worried that they might outlive him personally. The roaches can't get up the toilet, but they have more success in scaling the walls. Soon the walls are covered in a mass of roaches, the air filling with a constant cacophony of chittering and scratching that sends chills up the spine of the panicking D-Class. The roaches start to march across the ceiling, and the D-Class gets the distinct impression that, if he doesn't do something fast, he's going to be completely covered. In desperation, he throws his shoe across the room with all his might, shouting curses as he does, but it doesn't do any good. His shoe hits the opposite wall and bounces off, dropping into the swarm and quickly sinking beneath the rolling tide of chittering insects. His futile attack only provokes the insect mob, and several dozen roaches take flight, launching themselves at the D-Class. He shouts and claws them away as roaches land on his face and shoulders. They scramble up his neck and tangle themselves in his hair. He keeps shouting and swatting them away, but there are more and more of them every second. More roaches are swarming out from the black oil simmering in the bathtub every second, and now they all seem intent on the D-Class. They crawl inside his mouth as he screams. He gags and coughs, trying to spit them out, but it seems that they're already crawling down his throat. In his panic, he slips and lurches forward, screaming and flailing his arms helplessly. He dives into the writhing mass of roaches. Within seconds, he is covered in a sheet of living insects. The observing agent is speechless, unable to comprehend the sheer insanity of what she is seeing, but watching the D-Class be consumed by cockroaches prompts her to vomit in disgust. The retching, gagging noises can be heard over the intercom, hardly professional behavior, but we're way past worrying about that by now. By now, the bathtub is almost completely filled with black goo. The roaches start to return to the bathtub, scaling the tub walls in vast waves and throwing themselves into the pool of dark tar. As they retreat, they reveal the decimated remains of the D-Class. The corpse is ragged and bloody, partially eaten, its stomach visibly bloated. It twitches slightly, and the observing agent momentarily wonders if it's somehow possible that the D-Class personnel survived his ordeal, even though even a brief glance at the state of the corpse should make it clear it would be impossible. 
there's just far too much damage. It's obvious, in fact, that the twitching is caused by roaches that have burrowed into the body, squirming beneath its skin. Suddenly, something else begins to rise from the bathtub. It's another corpse, one in a much more advanced state of decomposition, to the point that it's nearly skeletal, but there's still enough flesh clinging to its bones that you might be able to recognize it for the person it used to be. Under the black ooze, there's still a ghost of a face clinging to the skull, liquefying eyeballs still rolling around loosely in its dark sockets, tattered lips hanging off of stained teeth. Its eyes swivel toward the prone body of the D-Class with malevolent intention. Black tar drips from its arms and skull. It places one hand against the rim of the bathtub, the other against the blue wallpapered wall, and slowly hoists itself up and out of the pool of black tar, displacing another few dozen cockroaches with its movements. The corpse slowly stumbles to its feet, dribbling black ichor, and steps out of the bathtub. It staggers across the room with sticky, uncertain steps, leaving a trail of roaches and black goo. When it reaches the body of the D-Class, it grabs it by the leg and then drags it back across the bathroom floor toward the tub. The skeletal corpse pulls the body of the D-Class personnel into the tub, and both of them submerge into the black goo. The remaining cockroaches follow suit, jumping into the black oil and slowly sinking below the surface. At the same time, the level of the black substance begins to fall as it starts to swirl away down the drain. After several minutes, the black goo has completely drained away, leaving no trace that it ever existed. The roaches, the strange living cadaver, and the corpse of the D-Class have all completely vanished, so that by the time the door of the bathroom clicks open again, there's nothing to suggest that there's anything at all strange about this room. Too late, the agent bursts into the room, flinging open the now unlocked door with all her might. She scans the room in confusion, knowing that just moments ago, it was the scene of grisly carnage. There's no evidence of that now, but just the memory, the sight of the D-Class's bloated corpse, the sound of thousands of cockroaches marching and scuttling in unison, is enough to make the bile rise in her throat. She leans forward, hands on her knees, and vomits again. She's seen a lot as an SCP Foundation agent, but this SCP is definitely not one for the faint of heart, or the sick of stomach. What just happened here? Unfortunately, this is far from an unusual occurrence when you're dealing with SCP-6698. SCP-6698 is to all appearances a perfectly ordinary bathroom. Until it started to manifest anomalous behavior, it existed as a second-story bathroom in a private residence somewhere in Alabama in the United States. The first instance of anomalous behavior happened the day after a resident of the household, a 16-year-old male, reported killing an unusually large cockroach in the bathroom. The following night, when using the same bathroom, that same resident was overheard yelling in fright. His screams were followed by sounds described as a sink breaking and then a body falling against a crunchy and wet surface. Other members of the family attempted to respond to these sounds, but found that the door to the bathroom refused to open. Once the noises subsided, they found the door suddenly quite pliable, but when they checked inside, they could not find any evidence of the bathroom's teenage victim. The SCP Foundation quickly responded to the incident, amnesticizing the family and planting a suggestion that the missing teenager simply ran away from home into their subconscious. The family was moved from the residence, which was then purchased by a Foundation shell company to allow for further testing. When a human enters the room, the door to the bathroom immediately closes and locks. The door will remain locked until the event is completed. Attempts to physically damage the door when it is in its locked state have all met with failure. A recording camera was installed in the bathroom to allow agents to observe the event as it unfolds. Victims who unknowingly wander into SCP-6698 will find themselves trapped. Moments after the door locks, cockroaches will start to emerge from the drain of the bathtub. Once the swarm has reached sufficient mass, the roaches will attack and feed upon the victim. At the same time, a black oil will start to fill the tub, laying the stage for the emergence of the mysterious tar zombie, which then removes the corpse of the victim from the scene. The observing agent noted that the skeletal corpse she saw emerge from the tub bore a superficial resemblance to the missing 16-year-old male, raising questions about how SCP-6698 might have bonded with its original victim. Testing was suspended following the death of the D-Class personnel, so it is currently unclear if the same tar zombie appears during every instance, or if perhaps SCP-6698 pulls from a rotating roster of previous victims during its manifestations. At this moment, the relationship between the tar zombie, the black ooze, and the legions of carnivorous cockroaches is unclear, but large amounts of spectral energy have been detected in the room, leading to an assumption that the event must be supernatural in nature and to the involvement of the Department of Spectral Phenomena. 
Since SCP-6698 only attacks victims who enter the bathroom and does not appear to be capable of manifestation once the door is open, the SCP Foundation has attached a special apparatus to prevent the door from closing of its own accord, and assigned SCP-6698 a designation of safe. One thing that is for sure, though, is that of all the ways that deadly SCP anomalies might choose to do away with their victims, being eaten alive from the inside by a swarm of scuttling cockroaches probably ranks up there as one of the worst. So that's something to think about the next time that you're looking for a little privacy in the bathroom. A young man and his girlfriend enter the apartment they share. She tosses her keys on the entryway table as the man checks the time on his phone. He reminds the young woman that they will need to leave soon if they don't want to miss the movie they have purchased tickets for. The woman agrees, but she wants to take a quick shower before they leave. As she goes to freshen up, the man sits down at his computer to get in a quick round or two of his favorite online squad-based first-person shooter. He puts on his headset and jumps into a game. Before he knows it, he's just finished his third round. He checks the time on his phone again and realizes that they were running late. He takes off his headphones and is confused when he hears what sounds like the shower still running. He gets up and goes to the bathroom door and listens. The shower is definitely still on. The man knocks on the door and asks if everything is alright. He waits a moment, but there's no response. He knocks again, and still, nothing. She doesn't usually take showers this long, and he immediately worries that she might have passed out or… well, he doesn't even want to think about it. I'm coming in, okay? He announces as he opens the door to check on her. The man immediately notices how steamy the room is. The hot water must have been running for a while, and he's worried she really did pass out from the heat. What's going on, are you okay? He asks, and when there's no response again, he pulls open the shower curtain to find… nothing. Just an empty tub. There's no sign of his girlfriend anywhere. The man is beyond confused. He turns off the water and goes to the bedroom, but she isn't in there either. He runs to the front door, but it's still locked, and her keys are sitting on the table. He unlocks the door and sticks his head out into the hallway anyway, but nothing is out there. What is going on? He checks the bedroom again, then the bathroom, but she hasn't suddenly reappeared in either. He's in complete shock, unsure of what could be happening. He sits down on the toilet and puts his head in his hands. His head is spinning as it feels like the world is suddenly falling down all around him. The police are immediately suspicious of the man's story. His girlfriend simply vanished while taking a shower? Do you expect us to believe that? The detective asks. The man has no answer, though. It's as if she simply blinked out of existence. He's convinced she must still be in the building somewhere, that she somehow slipped out without him noticing but none of the security footage from inside the building shows anything abnormal. There's footage from the cameras in the lobby of them entering the building, but nothing after that of her leaving. Just as in every missing person case like this, the boyfriend is the number one suspect, but without any evidence, they can't hold him any longer. After many long hours of interviews, they finally allow him to leave, but not back to the apartment, since it's an active crime scene. The man has no family to speak of, and his few friends seem to have the same suspicions as the police and want nothing to do with him. His girlfriend was the only person he truly had in the world, and now she's gone. He's put up in a shabby motel, and days pass, then weeks, then months, but no evidence of the missing woman ever turns up. The man replays the memory of that day over and over in his head, searching for some kind of answer, but try as he might, he can't remember anything helpful. No clue as to what could have happened. The case is completely cold, and has been from the very start. The police eventually have to move on to newer, more solvable cases, and they finally allow the man to return home. He's overwhelmed with emotion the first time he enters the apartment. The place is a mess. It looks like the police turned it inside out looking for clues. Not knowing what else to do, he starts the long process of cleaning up the apartment. After hours of putting things away, he eventually gathers the strength to go to the one room he's been avoiding, the bathroom. He opens the door to the last place he's certain his girlfriend was. He enters to find that it looks like the rest of the apartment, as if someone has looked at every single object. But just like him, the police never found any trace of where she went. After straightening up this last room, he decides that he should take a shower and go to bed. It fills him with dread to think about standing in the last place he knows where she was, but he's had months to grieve the loss of his girlfriend and he's decided that he needs to move on, whatever that means when someone goes missing without a trace. He turns on the shower and lets the water heat up before stepping in. Once he's in, every thought he has is about her. He wonders if she ever actually got in the shower at all, or somehow used it as a diversion to slip out unseen. 
He just can't figure out how. The day's events race through his mind, just as they have a thousand times before, but his thoughts are interrupted when he notices that the water has started to pool around his feet. He looks down and sees that the drain cover looks normal. Maybe there's a clog, though. Do showers clog when they're not used? He has no idea. He bends down to get a closer look. The long, black creature emerges from the drain in the blink of an eye and latches onto his mouth, muffling him before he even has a chance to scream. He struggles and pulls down the curtain on top of him as he falls back onto the shower floor. But it's already too late. And in a matter of minutes, he too will be gone without a trace. Is there anything more comforting after a hard day than a nice, long, hot shower? The answer to that is no, there is nothing better. But that relaxing shower might just be the last you ever take when, unbeknownst to you, your pipes are home to an instance of SCP-153, also known as drain worms. SCP-153 refers to a species that resembles the common nematode, or roundworm, consisting of a long, thin body with a large mouth on one end. While some roundworms can grow to as large as a meter long, which is in itself a disturbing thought, SCP-153 instances can be much, much larger, and it is estimated that they can reach up to nearly 10 meters in length, though it is hypothesized that some instances in the wild may grow even longer. These worm-like creatures will feed off of any available organic material. However, their favorite form of sustenance is fresh animal tissue, and they appear to have an especially strong predilection towards human flesh. In order to satiate their desire to feed on their preferred prey, SCP-153 has developed a rather unique predatory style that perfectly suits its elongated body structure. While it is unknown just where they originate, they are most often found in the pipes of sewer and drainage systems. 153 instances will swim up those pipes, seeking out ones that lead to people's homes, and especially those that connect to showers and bathtubs. Once they reach the end of the pipe, SCP-153 will latch onto the drain cover and begin secreting an acidic substance. The acid quickly dissolves the drain cover, and SCP-153 will position its own mouth in its place, which it then is able to camouflage as the missing drain cover almost perfectly. Once SCP-153 has taken this position, it is virtually impossible to distinguish it from the original or discern that anything has changed. SCP-153 will then lie in wait until it detects that someone has entered the shower or bathtub. Once the unsuspecting person has begun to bathe, it will very quickly emerge from the drain, latching onto the victim's face, most likely in order to prevent them from calling for help. It then begins to rapidly secrete more of the same acid that it used to dissolve the drain cover. With how effectively it was able to dissolve metal, it's no surprise that SCP-153 is able to quickly produce the same effect on its victim. Their skin, muscle, and bone will all be almost immediately liquefied, allowing SCP-153 to feed on the slurry, and the drain worms feed extremely quickly as well. After just several minutes, basically nothing will remain of the person who stepped into the shower, and 153 will retreat back into the drain, leaving no signs that it was ever there, save for the missing drain cover. The SCP Foundation became aware of this anomaly following multiple mysterious missing person cases that all had one key element in common. Each was reported as having disappeared after entering a bathroom to either shower or take a bath. The Foundation soon discovered that large populations of SCP-153 instances were living in the sewers beneath several major American cities and immediately began enacting containment procedures. The Foundation collected as many specimens as they could and brought them to Bioresearch Area 12, where they keep them contained in 10 by 10 by 5 meter tanks that are kept partially filled with sewage and other organic material for them to feed on. Of course, it is of the utmost importance that these containers are never connected to any other plumbing systems, either internal or external. With several specimens contained, the Foundation began researching the creatures in order to hopefully better understand them and how they were able to develop such complex hunting techniques. Research was also approved to find out whether they could be used as a sort of waste disposal system in certain extreme circumstances, such as with SCP-2717, a mass of living animal tissue that has grown to line nearly four kilometers of sewer pipes beneath Amsterdam. A small number of SCP-153 instances were approved for release into the wild in order to test whether they could stall the spread of 2717. However, this experiment was halted following some disturbing new reports. More missing person reports came to the Foundation's attention that bore the hallmarks of an SCP-153 attack. But these new reports were not limited to people who vanished after bathing. It now appears that SCP-153 has further adapted and has begun to emerge not just from showers and bathtub drains, 
but now also from sinks, and yes, even toilets. The Foundation is unaware of just how many instances of SCP-153 continue to exist in the wild, but there's no doubt that many continue to live and hunt undetected in sewers around the world. This anomaly, which has been classified as Euclid, is taken very seriously by the Foundation, and any reports of people who go missing from bathrooms are immediately investigated for signs of SCP-153. Field agents are to be equipped with infrared and ultraviolet sensors, which can bypass SCP-153's camouflage, and if specimens are able to be captured alive, then they are to be brought to Area 12 for further research. But don't bother worrying too much the next time you step into the tub. If you've been targeted by SCP-153, there's not much you'll be able to do anyway, and your worries will soon be going down the drain, along with whatever remains of you. A gigantic monster stomps across the land, with nothing able to stop its rampage except for, Come and eat! cries out a voice, and the monster suddenly stops and falls to the side. The child picks up his toy and runs back to where his mother and father have spread out a picnic lunch. As they eat, the boy asks his father about the nearby buildings, a series of six identical structures, each of which is a small rectangular building with a satellite dish on top of it. The weathered buildings look like they have been out here for some time, and the father tells the boy that he isn't sure exactly what they are or what their purpose is, but that they were probably built during the war. What war? The young boy asks. The Pacific War, his father answers. What was that? It was a war fought by many countries of the world. Why did they fight? The boy asks. Well, there were a lot of reasons. What were some of the reasons? The father has played this game many times before, and he knows if he doesn't end this line of questioning now, that he'll never be able to eat his lunch. The mother, sensing the same, tells the boy that if he wants to, he can go and play with his toy some more. The boy doesn't need to be given the option again. He quickly gets up and grabs his toy monster before running off to play. Don't go too far, his mother calls out as she watches her son head in the direction of one of the buildings. The boy stops in the shadow of one of the large satellite dishes and sits down in the grass to resume his monster's path of destruction across the countryside. As the monster moves through the tall grass though, the shadow he is sitting in suddenly starts to shift. The boy looks up to see that the satellite dish on top of the building is moving. With a groan, it begins to turn and change its angle. And it isn't just the one on the building closest to him that's moving. He can see that each of the six satellite dishes are doing the same thing. They're all turning to point towards the same spot on the horizon. The boy squints in the sunlight and sees what they're all now directed towards. Off, far in the distance, is a real monster. It's a massive looking creature, a huge half fish, half lizard, covered in scales and spiky fins. It must be at least 50 meters tall or more, and it's coming straight towards him. The boy can already hear the sounds of its giant webbed feet stomping and shaking the ground, and as it gets closer, its high-pitched shrieks and cries become audible too. Adding to the cacophony, an air raid siren begins to wail, followed by the sounds of gunfire, the marching of hundreds of boots, and the roar of engines. The boy looks around, but he doesn't see any of it. It's just him, the buildings, and the monster. The boy can't run, though. He's frozen in fear. All he can do is watch as it swipes at trees and power lines, knocking them down with ease, all while getting closer and closer. The satellite dishes finally finish their slow alignment, and there's a loud humming noise, followed by a loud cracking sound, as each one emits a bright beam of electricity at the monster. The creature stops its assault and howls in pain as the six satellites focus their beams on it. The beams disappear, and the monster appears stunned, but then it looks up and continues to come forward, this time even faster than before. The monster is only hundreds of feet away now, and the boy doesn't know what to do. He's too scared to even scream for help. He closes his eyes and starts to cry when he's abruptly lifted into the air. The boy opens his eyes to see that it's his father. He picks up the boy and starts to run as fast as he can. The boy can see over his father's shoulder that the monster has not changed its course to follow them. It seems to still be focused on the building he was playing next to. The monster finally reaches the building and begins swiping at it, tearing it apart as the other satellites slowly realign, all pointing at the creature once again. The sound of the invisible army increases, and the monster reels as if it is struck by unseen weapons. It suddenly rears back in pain as an artillery shell appears just feet away from it before exploding in the creature's face. But nothing seems able to deter it, and it keeps clawing at the building with the satellite dish. The father finally reaches the mother, who grabs the boy and embraces him tightly. There is a loud noise, and the family turns to watch as the monster finishes destroying the building and turns its attention to one of the others. But then the dishes unleash another blast of electricity at it with a thunderous crack. The 
creature howls in pain as it stumbles and falls to its knees. It is struggling to get back up when yet another blast hits it and it falls to the ground. It breathes a couple of final, labored breaths before it closes its eyes, its enormous tongue lolling out of its mouth. The creature is finally dead. A loud celebratory cheer goes up in the empty field from what sounds like hundreds of people as the creature begins to slowly fade from view before eventually disappearing completely. Meanwhile, all the family can do is stare in amazement at the bizarre scene they have just witnessed. The extremely strange events that just befell this average family may sound like the plot of a movie, and in some ways, it was, because this is SCP-2954, also known as Looping Kaiju Killing. SCP-2954 is an anomaly that consists of several distinct components. The first, SCP-2954-1A, are the six large structures that resemble buildings with satellite dishes, which are located near a now-deserted rural town in Japan. The word resemble is very important, because these are not actual satellite dishes, but instead appear to be nothing more than facsimiles of real ones. The interior of the SCP-2954-1A buildings lack all of the mechanical components one would expect to find inside, and instead contain only a crude rope and pulley system which control the satellite dishes on the building's roof. Despite their lack of internal machinery, the satellite dishes are nonetheless somehow capable of discharging powerful electric arcs of energy, which they only do when confronted by an SCP-2954-2 instance. SCP-2954-2 refers to creatures which have a mix of reptilian, amphibious, and fish-like traits. They are always 50 to 60 meters in height, and most of their body is smooth and blue-gray in color, except for their scaled underbellies, which are red. Both their back and forearms have large spiny fins, and SCP-2954-2 instances walk upright on two legs, though they are always hunchback. Their mouths are also always agape and are capable of spitting a highly corrosive acid. These creatures appear during a period of time that have been designated as Subaraya events. These events, which start every seven days, consist of a single instance of SCP-2954-2 manifesting near the SCP-2954-1A buildings before it begins destroying its surroundings. The buildings will then activate, turning their attention on the creature and firing their electric arcs at it in an attempt to stop its rampage. This will cause SCP-2954-2 to focus its attention on one of the buildings, which it will then try to destroy. As it does so, the sounds of weapons being fired, vehicles moving, and orders being shouted in Japanese can be heard. This phantom army, which has been designated as SCP-2954-1B, is only heard, not seen, and there are never any physical signs of their fight, save for the creature's own reactions to the weapons and the occasional artillery shell that will materialize in midair before striking it. During these Tsuburaya events, the SCP-2954-2 instance will always destroy at least one of the satellite dish buildings, and various other explosions roughly equivalent to what would be expected from small vehicles being destroyed will also be seen as it fights back against the 2954-1B army. Eventually, the combined assault of the 1A and 1B forces will be enough to overwhelm the creature, and it will collapse, grow transparent, and eventually disappear completely. A disembodied cheer will be heard, presumably from the 1B army, and any damage to the environment, including the 1A buildings, will be reversed. But what is the cause of this endless cycle of destruction and restoration? Where do the creatures come from, and what do they want? And who is the invisible army that always stands ready to fight back against the rampaging monsters? The answers to those questions may have been discovered while exploring the area where the Tsuburaya events take place. There, in another small abandoned building, SCP Foundation agents discovered a trove of objects that may shed some light on just what these creatures are. The objects located included various movie posters, film reels, and documents that appear to be related to the production and distribution of motion pictures. The posters seem to depict creatures quite similar to the SCP-2954-2 instances, and the title of the poster when translated from Japanese reads, Fukairu's Assault. When agents viewed the footage on the film reels, they found that it depicted a scenario quite similar to the Tsuburaya events. Also of interest are a series of notes found within a filing cabinet inside of the building, with several being of particular note. The first, when translated from Japanese, reads, Our sponsor gave 20 monsters to shoot. We'll pick the best footage. The second, which is dated to 1974, says, Filming completed. Don't forget, call our sponsor to say further shipments are unneeded. The third and fourth are both addressed to what may be the film's producers, and they read, Do you need more Fukairu? We can resupply until you're satisfied. And, you have not replied for a while. 
Regardless, we will send another shipment. Happy filming. But perhaps strangest of all is that there are multiple similar versions of the last note, and while the oldest is dated to 1972, additional instances continue to appear to this day, with new letters sporadically manifesting inside of the filing cabinet. The obvious danger that is caused by a rampaging 50-meter-tall monster is clear, and this anomaly has been classified Euclid as a result. Though since the creature is inevitably always killed by the SCP-2954-1 forces, containment is instead focused on keeping the public away from the area. Guards have been stationed around the area to prevent civilians from entering during Tsuburaya events, and any members of the public who do manage to witness an event are to be administered Class A amnestics. What is the origin of these looping kaiju? Did someone attempt to harness an anomalous source in order to produce special effects for their film? If so, were they killed by their own creation before being able to turn it off, leading to a never-ending cycle of attacks? While we may never know the answer for sure, at least the result is entertaining. Provided you keep your distance, that is. Just a little further, your friend says. They're leading your group, and as you all emerge from the woods, your flashlight illuminates a tall chain-link fence with barbed wire strung across the top. How are you supposed to get over that? Another of your friends asks, and the group's leader has just the answer. They point their flashlight several yards down, where you see a large pine tree that has fallen over onto the fence, creating a bridge that you should be able to shimmy along to get over the barrier. You and your group of friends take turns climbing over the toppled tree before dropping down on the other side of the tall fence. After dusting yourselves off, your group walks further into the clearing until you come to an old set of railroad tracks that are rusty and look like they haven't been used in some time. Well, one of your more incredulous friends asks, what's supposed to happen? The group's leader explains that if we're lucky, we'll see it. See what? The ghost light. They go on to explain that on certain nights, a mysterious light will appear in this very clearing, wandering the area around the railroad tracks. What is it? You ask. Your friend tells you that many years ago, maybe a hundred or more, this was once a bustling and busy stretch of railroad. One night, a Union Pacific worker came out to check a portion of the tracks that were supposedly damaged. The worker went out into the night with his dim lantern and he walked along the tracks until he stopped in this very clearing. He spotted what looked to be damage to one of the rails and bent down to examine it. No one knows why he didn't hear the train barreling towards him or hear its whistle cry out in the night, but the man would never hear anything again, as BAM! The train took his head clean off. Now, with only his lantern to guide him in the night, the headless railway worker wanders this clearing, still searching for his missing head. That's a stupid story, one of your friends says. How could someone not notice an entire train? I don't know, but it's true. No, it isn't. As the two go back and forth, you suddenly notice something in the distance. Um, hey, look over there. Everyone follows the direction you're pointing and sees it. A dim ball of light hanging in the air. See, your friend says. I told you it was true. He steps towards the ball of light, and as he does, it actually moves, drifting back at the same rate he comes forward, as if to maintain the exact same distance. When your friend takes a step back, the light moves just the same. Look, over there, you say. Another one. What's going on? Were these the ghosts of multiple headless rail workers, all searching for their missing craniums? This light is brighter than the other, though, and rather than maintaining a set distance from your group, it's slowly moving towards you. What do we do? One asks. I don't know, the leader says. I've never dealt with a ghost before. The light continues to move towards your group, and no one knows what to do. Frozen in fear, you watch as the light passes straight through you, and your friends start to scream as it is absorbed into your chest. Their cries become muffled, though, sounding to you as if they're underwater. Your hearing isn't the only thing that feels that way. Your whole body suddenly feels as though you're submerged in liquid. You can't breathe, and you thrash at the air, trying to swim, but nothing is there. You scream and choke and fall to the ground as the ball of light passes through you like you weren't even there, leaving you in the dirt gasping for breath. Your friends rush over to help you up, asking what happened, but there's no time to explain because two even bigger, brighter lights have appeared. You're terrified of what they might do to you, but before you can even think about running, a voice calls out from the darkness. Stop right there! The two big balls of light are headlights attached to the front of a black SUV, and a pair of angry-looking armed guards have just gotten out of it. The last thing you hear is one of the men say, I can't believe we have to deal with this, before you feel the sting of a dart hitting your thigh and your vision goes black. You open your eyes to find that you're sitting in your own car with your group of friends. They too appear to have been asleep and are just waking. 
you're parked on the side of the road next to a thick forest of pine trees, and the sun is just starting to rise. What were we supposed to do again? One of your friends asks from the back seat. I don't remember, you say. But the sun's coming up. Let's get out of here. And you drive your group of friends back home with no memory of the previous night's events. This group of teens was quite lucky. What they thought was little more than an urban legend known as the Gurdon Lights was actually a mysterious and dangerous anomaly which the SCP Foundation knows much better as SCP-2640. SCP-2640 is a temporal anomaly that is found within a 5,000 square meter area near the town of Gurdon, Arkansas. The area is densely covered with pine trees, with the only man-made object found within it being a set of railroad tracks that bisect the area. Of most interest within SCP-2640, though, are the strange entities that manifest inside. Designated as SCP-2640-1, these entities are floating orbs of light that are capable of appearing alone or in groups, though no more than 12 at once have ever been observed manifesting at the same time. Their light will vary in intensity, from 75 to 450 lux, which is roughly equivalent to the range of light produced by standard light bulbs, and the color is always a bluish white. The lights will normally be seen to travel slowly within SCP-2640, though they have been observed moving quite quickly on occasion, with the quickest ones having been measured traveling at speeds of up to 60 kilometers per hour. There is also a connection between the luminosity of the entities and their behavior. Those measured at less than 150 lux will not interact with humans, instead maintaining a distance of at least 20 meters from the nearest observer at all times. Attempts to move closer will lead to the entity moving away at the same rate, ensuring that it maintains the same 20 meters of distance at all times. On the opposite end of the scale, those that are closer to 450 lux are very active and will approach and even interact with humans. In some instances, the brighter SCP-2640-1 entities will actually pass through solid objects, including people, which leads to a very strange sensation for the person involved. When this has occurred, the subject has described a sensation of being suspended in liquid or floating in a swimming pool, despite there being no outward physical changes to them. This feeling of being in water will start the moment a 2640-1 entity makes contact with their body and will cease once it is no longer touching them. The SCP-2640-1 entities appear bound to the SCP-2640 area, and any that approach the boundaries will slowly dim until they disappear completely. In order to better understand the nature of SCP-2640, and specifically the 2640-1 entities found within, an expedition into the area using D-Class personnel was authorized. The three Class Ds were equipped with special equipment capable of measuring the relative reality distortion in a given area, and told to follow along the railroad tracks that run within SCP-2640, with orders to report anything they experienced that was out of the ordinary. As they progressed deeper into SCP-2640, their equipment detected significant reality distorting effects, and just as they did, the SCP-2640-1 entities began appearing. Despite being quite scared of what they perceived as ghosts, the Class D personnel were under strict orders not to run. A 2640-1 that was on the brighter end of the scale approached one of the D-Classes and passed through his body, leading him to experiencing the sensation of being underwater and, since he was unable to swim, made him believe that he might drown. The entity passed harmlessly through him and he was left with no lasting injuries, at least not any physical ones. After this test, and given the extremely high reality distorting effects that were detected in the area, it was theorized by researcher Dr. Connors that SCP-2640 might be one of the strongest temporal anomalies on the planet. His report goes on to hypothesize that SCP-2640-1 are actually life forms from another time period that we can see visually due to this anomaly, yet cannot interact with lest we cause irreparable damage to the time-space continuum. Dr. Connors also noted that the area of SCP-2640 appeared to be slowly growing and in order to prevent further spread, the installation of several Zyank Anastasikos constant temporal sinks, or exacts, was authorized. And it was a good thing that the exacts were installed, because there was soon an incident that would prove how necessary they are. In a debriefing after said event with Tony Hargrove, a level 3 tech support staff, the SCP Foundation learned a horrifying reality about the true nature of SCP-2640. Mr. Hargrove explained that he was sent into SCP-2640 in order to assess the damage to the Foundation assets after a major tornado had passed through the area. He explained that while power was still running to the site, one of the exacts had been damaged and needed to be replaced, so a maintenance team was sent to install a spare that was kept on site. 
As the maintenance team approached the area where the exacts was no longer functioning, they reported that there were numerous 2640-1 instances out, more than they had ever seen before, and a higher concentration of the brighter instances than usual. Soon after they reported this, Hargrove lost contact with the maintenance team and decided to go investigate himself. As he entered the SCP-2640 area, he saw something that he had never seen before. There weren't just a few more instances of 2640-1s than normal, but hundreds, maybe even thousands, floating all around him. There were so many that they lit up the sky to the point where he didn't even need a flashlight. Hargrove followed the same railroad tracks that the maintenance team had, and after walking several hundred meters, he spotted something in the mud next to the tracks. It was the replacement temporal sink that they were supposed to be installing, and there was blood on it. He realized that there wasn't just blood on the machine, but it was everywhere, covering the ground all around him. Then he saw something else, an SCP-2640-1 instance near him, but different somehow. I can't remember how I first saw it, he said. Right behind the orbs, there was this spot where the rain just wasn't. Like it was bending around some invisible mass, some, some great thing behind each orb. And once I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. Hargrove tried to step back away from the creature and fell into a ditch next to the tracks, clutching the exacts in his arms as the creature seemed to swim towards him. As he lay as still as he could in the ditch, he got the sense that this 2640-1 instance wasn't just randomly moving towards him, it was looking for him. As the void where the rain ceased to be swam over him through the air, he attempted to lie as still as he could, still holding tightly to the exacts. The SCP-2640-1 instance turned and circled over him, like a shark searching for its prey in a cloud of blood, before gliding away into the trees. At that moment, Hargrove knew that the SCP-2640-1 entities weren't what the Foundation thought they were. These weren't just beautiful balls of light that danced and played in the darkness. They were something else, something horrible, something dangerous. He knew that his maintenance team would never be found, and that the ditch he was lying in that was slowly filling with rainwater was mixed with their blood. The SCP-2640-1s were hunting them, and they never had any idea. Hargrove knew what he had to do. He crawled through the ditch, stopping any time a 2640-1 got near to him, holding his breath until long after it passed. It took hours of inching along on his belly in the water and mud until he finally reached the point where the damage exacts was located. He managed to get the new temporal sink online, and as it powered on, he watched as the 2640-1 lights around him slowly started to fade and then disappear once again. The deaths of the four Foundation personnel who were on the maintenance team, as well as six other civilians who were killed, were attributed to the tornado, and Mr. Hargrove requested that he be administered a Class B amnestic and reassigned to a new location, both of which are pending approval. The rail line that runs into SCP-2640 has been decommissioned, and a three-meter-tall electrified fence has been erected around the entirety of the area in order to prevent civilians from approaching. No fewer than eight Zyank and Estacos constant temporal sinks are placed in the surrounding area in order to prevent the further spread of SCP-2640, and a subterranean miniaturized pressurized water reactor has been installed on site in order to provide constant, uninterrupted power. The Disinformation Bureau has an ongoing dissemination campaign to further the notion that the SCP-2640-1 lights are nothing more than an urban legend, and should any civilians manage to witness them, they are administered Class B amnestics in order to keep this Euclid-class anomaly a secret. Just what is the true nature of SCP-2640, and perhaps more importantly, SCP-2640-1? Is the breach of our reality a look into the past when this area was covered by an ancient ocean? or a glimpse into the future, when the seas have swallowed it once again? No matter which is the answer, the reality is that there is something there now, something that has managed to pierce the veil of time and make us its prey. Quiet, quiet, duck down, out of sight over there. Are you recording? Why aren't you recording? The camera woman has no desire to shoulder her camera yet again. It has been like this all day. The three of them will walk ten feet, then all of a sudden, the presenter will dive behind a bush and beckon for herself and their guard to do the same. Her patience for it is certainly starting to wear thin, clearly nowhere near as thin as their security guards, however, as the man flexes his trigger finger against the side of the rifle, grumbling to himself in Swahili. The camera woman should never have taken this job. She knows that now, but they are far too deep in the Tanzanian wilderness to turn back now. They parked their jeep up in the early hours of the morning and started walking at sunrise, 
The faint blue tinge to the dark forest around them tells her it must be almost sunrise again. The presenter turns to her and runs a hand through his carefully sculpted hair. His pink skin has been burning and peeling in the sun all day long. He looks like he'd give the flamingos from earlier a run for their money as she switches the LED ring light on. The presenter clears his throat and wipes the sweat from his brow. Rumor has it that the area we are entering into now is patrolled by highly sophisticated militarized drones. Myself and my crew are risking our lives here, but that's just what it takes when you decide to live as an extreme vegan. He insists on recording several more takes. By the fifth attempt, the camera woman stops hitting record, not worth filling up the memory with this waste of a shot. Extreme vegan. What will they come up with next? She had moved to Tanzania with dreams of working on documentaries with a capital D. Rich, beautiful shots of the world's most endangered animals basking by a watering hole or hunting to feed their starving cubs. Real footage, not this reality show nonsense. The presenter had touched down the previous day, immediately started asking about where the nearest fast food chain was, then threw a tantrum because the Wi-Fi in the hotel lobby was too slow. Bad as he was, he at least seemed mostly harmless. But their security guard… The camera woman glances over to him. The man seems more like a local thug with a gun than a trained professional. The studio must have been trying to save money hiring him. Goodness knows they were cutting costs hiring her to do video and audio. She should have smelled a rat and just said no. A light. It sweeps through the trees so quickly it almost catches the three of them. The camera woman hits the dirt just in time. The camera bumps awkwardly into her shoulder so hard she almost cries out. A mechanical whirring fills the night. The light sweeps this way and that as they all lie motionless on the ground. Then, just as abruptly as it appeared, the light swings away and the sound fades. Maybe those drones aren't as made up as they sounded. The presenter is clearly very shaken. His wide eyes dart around between the trees as they all get back to their feet. So much for being an extreme vegan. The camera woman glances over at their security guard. A twisted grin lights up his face. She notices a little pendant has slipped out of his shirt. A small white shard hanging from a handmade chain. Even in the dead of night, the camera woman has filmed enough elephants to recognize ivory when she sees it. The security guard, no, poacher, meets her gaze. His smile widens. He speaks Swahili in a low voice. We keep moving. Shouldering the rifle, the poacher marches onwards in the direction the drone had just been a few moments ago. The camera woman and presenter have no option but to follow. For a long time, the group walks in silence. It is the longest the presenter has gone without opening his mouth since his plane touched down. The camera woman would be enjoying the peace and quiet if it hadn't been for the sickening unease that had settled over them. Had that drone been real? If it had, and what exactly were they walking into right now? Some kind of secret facility? GMO research? Labor camps? But it just looks like any other patch of forest in Tanzania. Only… it doesn't. Come to think of it, as they walk, the camera woman starts to notice little differences. At first, they're too subtle to put a finger on, just a different feel to the air or a strange sound. Is it the plants, perhaps? She's no botanist, so doesn't really know what she's looking at. But she's spent enough time out in the wild here to know a few plants. But now, she's spotting all kinds of strange new ones. A bush with huge red leaves here, a tree with long purple fruit there. She asks the presenter what they are. He looks up at the purple fruit tree, perplexed. Wasn't this supposed to be the whole point of this documentary? Exploring the furthest reaches of the world, looking for vegan alternatives? No idea, but let's roll the camera anyway. Ready? The presenter plucks a fruit and presents it to the lens, immediately spouting off about the fruit's medicinal qualities, levels of fiber, natural sugars, and low water consumption. All lies. The camera woman scowls at him. The presenter turns the fruit over and screams, throwing it as far as his skinny arms will allow. Never one to waste a shot, the camera woman follows the fruit on instinct, zooming in on it as it lands at the foot of a tree. Out from under the purple skin crawls an earwig. It's huge, just over three inches long at a guess. That's strange. If she didn't know any better, she'd think that was… A voice startles the three of them. It booms out from behind them, just up the slope. The presenter swivels so fast he falls over. The camera woman points the camera up the hill and snaps the figure into focus. The poacher pulls back the bolt on his rifle, finger already on the trigger. In the dark, they can hardly make out what they are looking at. It must be a man. It spoke in a man's voice, but it towers over all of them. It must be nearly seven feet tall. They can't discern any kind of human silhouette. Odd shapes jut out this way and that. 
What is it made from? The voice calls out again, a deep, rumbling voice, like an earthquake heard from the ocean floor or echoing through a forest. There were other sounds layered into its voice, high twittering sounds and guttural growls. The camera woman looks to her companions, clearly neither of them understand what it's saying either. Not Swahili, not English, not French or Arabic. The intent of the voice is very clear, however. They are not welcome. For the first time ever, the presenter is lost for words. The poacher shifts the butt of the rifle against his shoulder. Great. Now this is her job. The camera woman lowers her camera rig to the ground and raises both hands, approaching the figure carefully. The sun breaks over the horizon further up the slope. In just a few moments, she'll be able to see the stranger, whatever it is. Speaking Swahili, she explains that they are a film crew, here to shoot a documentary. They do not intend any harm and will make as little disturbance to the environment as possible. The creature does not seem to understand and repeats its previous command. It definitely sounded like a command, at least. The camera woman turns helplessly to her companions, just in time to see a small shadow rushing them. It runs on all fours, covering the ground impossibly fast. Ignoring the poacher and presenter, it snatches up her camera from the ground and hurls it at a tree. It crunches into the wood and falls to the ground in pieces. Sunlight breaks over the horizon, flooding the valley with light. The camera woman whirls around and glimpses the figure up the hill. It is a man, isn't it? Towering at nearly seven feet, the man is adorned with flowers, blossoms, and fungi. Animal skulls and pelts hang from his shoulders. Colorful face paint etches patterns, ancient and proud, deep into his features. African buffalo horns grow proudly from his head, accentuating a triumphant floral headpiece. But a glimpse is all she gets. The figure vanishes. A sweet-scented breeze rushes down to meet her from where he was standing just a moment ago. Where'd he go? The presenter cries. The camera woman can see something dangerous has lit up the man's face. He's found his story. She just doesn't know quite what it is yet. The poacher also has a wry smile on his face. He's looking at the discarded purple fruit from before. No, wait. He's looking at the earwig still crawling around it. She follows his gaze, and it confirms her suspicions from before. That's a St. Helena earwig, sure as the daylight streaming onto its scuttling legs. Declared extinct in 1967. The presenter is already marching off, further down the valley. The poacher shoulders his rifle and follows, not even glancing at the camera woman. She goes over to her broken camera and kneels down. No hope. She takes out the SD card from it and pockets it. What had that creature been that had thrown it at the tree? A monkey of some kind? The presenter calls out to her. Forget the camera, I've got a hidden one in my pocket. It'll look more authentic anyway. As they walk, they see more and more wildlife. In the early dawn, various animals are rising to their feet, stretching and wandering through the trees. At first, just small creatures, geckos, tortoises, insects. But soon they see gazelle, a family of oryx, even a hippo from a distance. But there is one thing each animal has in common. They were all declared extinct years ago, sometimes centuries ago. The camera woman keeps her mouth shut. The last thing she wants is for the poacher to know that. Although judging from the spring in his step, he's already well on his way to figuring it out. All of a sudden, the forest opens out. A watering hole the size of a lake fills their view. Animals of all sorts fly, swim, bathe, drink, and play in the morning air. Parakeets dance overhead. Rhinos lounge in the shallows. A dodo marches squarely past them on its way to join its friends. This has to be some kind of dream, surely. The penny finally drops for the presenter. He turns to his companions, wide-eyed, ready to say something, when he freezes, staring at something behind them. A shadow falls over them all. The camera woman turns to see an elephant, white as the morning snow, with round, pink eyes, old and wrinkled as time itself. It is hulkingly big, impossibly big. It dwarfs any bull elephant she's ever shot by several tons. The giant walks slowly, one plodding step at a time, right past them. So close she can almost reach out and touch it. Every part of her wants to. Only she knows better. You don't interfere with nature. The elephant passes them and disappears into the woods. She looks excitedly at her companions. The poacher has a glint in his eye. The presenter is hurrying off along the water's edge. Her eyes follow his movement. There, on the shore, kneels the towering man from before. He's beside a panting and straining ibex. She's on her side, belly swollen, blood mixing with the lake's water. The camera woman draws closer, watching the man stroke the animal's side gently. 
He cups a painted hand behind the animal's rump and delivers a baby effortlessly. Another slides out a moment later. He takes the tiny ibexes under each arm and walks them into the water, delicately washing them clean before returning them to their mother by the shore. The presenter calls out to him, raising a hand in greeting. Sir, sir, would you be interested in conducting a brief interview with me? It's for a network television documentary called Extreme Vegan. The figure stands and turns to them, wary. The two of them stand before him, separated by just a few feet, extinct animals chattering and cheeping all around them. In order to maintain such an eco-friendly lifestyle, you must be having a lot of plant-based alternatives in your diet. Oat milk, corn, avocado, what's your secret? As if on cue, a buffalo emerges from the water and approaches them. The man stoops, not taking an eye off the presenter, and reaches under the buffalo's body. Finding the teeth, he squeezes milk into his cupped hand. He raises his hand to his mouth and drinks slowly, staring the presenter down. After a moment, he squeezes more milk into his hand and stretches it out towards them. He says a word in that same ancient voice, only this time, it is softer, welcoming. Uh-uh, no way. Do you know how unethical it is to deprive that poor child of its natural milk? The presenter goes off on a rant. The man ignores him and offers the hand to the camerawoman instead. Without thinking, she steps forward and stoops to his hand. She drinks the milk straight from his palm. It's warm and fatty, thick like cream, but totally delicious. She looks into the man's eyes. They are a dark brown, but in the morning light, she catches flecks of gold, green, purple, and blue. The man's voice is even softer as he speaks again. Alanue. His name. That must be the man's name. She raises a hand to her chest, opening her mouth to introduce herself. Bang! The shot rips through the clearing. Animals screech and scatter, stampeding into the trees. Birds fill the sky, alighting from every tree, so much so that they tangle with one another. Camera woman's head whips around. The shot had come from the trees behind them. A roar, louder and more chilling than any animal could produce, swells from Alaniwe. This time, he doesn't just vanish. It's like he's raptured. Vines and roots shoot up out of the dirt, wrapping around him, creeping into his mouth and eye sockets. They wrench him into the ground with such force, it sends ripples across the lake. A rumbling fills the earth. The presenter cowers by the water's edge. He's useless. The camera woman takes off into the trees, following the sound of the shot. It doesn't take her long to find it. The white elephant lies on its side, rivers of red cascading across its chest, following the ancient furrows of its wrinkled skin. Its breathing stutters and rattles. The poacher stands before the dying animal. He turns to the camera woman, an unhinged grin lighting up his face. He opens his mouth to speak, but from out of his throat bursts a stem, blood spraying high into the air. The camera woman watches in abject horror as the plant grows up through the poacher. Roots ensnare his feet and ankles. The stem pierces his lower back and emerges from his throat. Offshoots stab their way out of his ribcage and temples. In a matter of seconds, it is finished. Pink flowers bloom at the tips. The poacher's corpse suspended like some kind of grotesque puppet. Without a sound, Alaniwe emerges from the trees and walks past the camera woman, past the poacher's body, and kneels by the elephant. He raises a hand to the creature's wound. The camera woman waits with bated breath. He's going to heal it. She can feel it. That's Alaniwe's final power. He can save the elephant, surely. But the blood keeps flowing. The elephant's breathing grows fainter until silence fills the clearing. No birds chattering, no breeze to rustle the trees, no more death rattles, silence. Then the most heartbreaking sound the camera woman has ever heard, Alaniwe, starts to sob. She is no longer welcome here. This is not her place. Without a word, the camera woman gets to her feet and walks back up the hill and out of the valley. As she walks, she hears footsteps approaching her. The presenter is there, arms laden with fruit and berries. He grins at her, explaining how he's going to take these home and plant them up. Start a smoothie chain called Alani Ways. If the first store goes well, they can franchise it, keeping the local feel but expanding to… A root stabs through his throat, interrupting him. A second stabs through his chest, shattering the hidden camera. So much for that smoothie chain. The camera woman doesn't look back. She walks through the day and the following night. She finds a road and stops. There's something in her pocket still. She takes out the SD card and looks at it. With a sad little smile, she takes the card between her fingers and snaps it clean in two. The man that you have just encountered deep in the Tanzanian wilderness may not be a man at all. Little is known about the genetic makeup of SCP-5411, otherwise known as Alaniwe. 
He appears to be a male, comprised of a combination of human, animal, and botanical components. The plants and pelts that the camerawoman observed him wearing are likely not items of clothing at all, but rather are naturally growing parts of Alaniwe's anatomy, giving him the appearance of a witch doctor. None of the documented attempts to communicate with Alaniwe have proved fruitful. While he does speak, his language is currently unidentified. He seems to have no understanding of English, Swahili, or Arabic, and is uninterested in learning them. Alaniwe roams freely within a 35-square-kilometer area of the southern Tanzanian savanna. This site has been designated SCP-5411-0, and an exclusion zone has been set up around it. Barbed wire fences and automated drones patrol the perimeter. A sacrificial goat is kept on site at all times, ready to be sacrificed as part of a binding ritual to keep SCP-5411 contained. Thus far, however, Alaniwe has not proved to be a threat to anyone other than those who disturb the delicate ecosystem which he inhabits. His land, SCP-5411-0, is home to a number of critically endangered or near-extinct species of African animals, many of whom are from different countries in the continent. Black rhinoceros, western gorilla, African penguins, and a so-called albino ghost elephant that is central to local folklore. It is unclear how these animals came to live in this area, but there is an evident connection between Alaniwe's care of nature and their continued survival. Alaniwe has been witnessed delivering newborn animals of a number of species, tending to injured animals and even regrowing grasslands to feed and house various creatures. Alaniwe is known to possess the powers of teleportation, intangibility, zoolingualism, florokinesis, and psychokinesis. When left alone, Alaniwe uses these abilities to tend to his local ecosystem. However, he is aggressive and decisive in disposing of anything he perceives to be a threat to the natural order. He is known to manifest and control small humanoid creatures roughly one meter tall that are made up of foliage, wood, mud, and rocks. These creatures, designated SCP-5411-1, exhibit basic predatory behavior, carrying out the bidding of SCP-5411, such as destroying our camerawoman's equipment. Capable of running at speeds of up to 75 kilometers an hour, the 58 known instances of SCP-5411-1 are to be treated as hostile as soon as they leave the SCP-5411-0 exclusion zone. However, a status quo seems to have settled between SCP researchers and SCP-5411. Alaniwe seems content within his ecosystem, and the conservation work he carries out within this area is proving invaluable to those researching climate change and habitat welfare. Much like the animals in nature documentaries, it is best that we choose not to interfere and let nature run its course. As you can clearly see, this completely throws our entire understanding of our place in the universe into complete disarray, says the astronomer as he excitedly makes his case to a panel of aged and supposedly learned advisors. My observations leave no doubt that everything we previously suspected to be the absolute truth is wrong. The panel of advisors murmur, and lean close together to whisper to each other. The astronomer can't hear what they are saying, but the passion and joy that he felt as he explained his findings to the room is quickly draining from his face. He can see the men mouthing the words, no, and lies, as they make disapproving gestures. But how could this be? Had they not understood what he was showing them? Maybe he didn't explain things in a way that they could comprehend. Here he was, the greatest scientist of his day, presenting hard facts, backed up by rigorous observations, and this was their reaction. The group of advisors finish conferring and grow quiet. The chief advisor clears his throat, and everyone in the room waits for him to speak. Royal scientist, this panel has examined your findings and listened to your theories. The advisor can't help but sneer at the word and has decided that the ideas you present are not only incorrect, but dangerous. The astronomer can't believe what he's hearing. This panel, acting under the authority of the king, has charged you with the crime of heresy. The astronomer is shocked. He steps towards the panel to plead with them, but he's stopped by a pair of guards who grab him by the arms. Stop! Stop! I'm a man of science! I only presented you with the truth! But no one seems moved by his appeals. The panel watches as the astronomer is dragged from the room, kicking and fighting, still insisting on his innocence. The screams echo through the dungeon as the torturer cranks another notch on the rack, stretching the astronomer's body just a little bit more. He has no idea how long this has been going on. Hours? Days? The pain has been excruciating and without end. He closes his eyes, 
trying to escape the torture by retreating into his mind. But he slapped on the face and brought back to the reality of his situation. Standing in front of him is the chief advisor, the same one who sentenced him to this inhumane treatment. You can end this any time you like. Simply recant your statements and admit you were mistaken, and all of this will be over. The astronomer is unsure if by over he means that they will release him, or simply kill him to put him out of his misery. But it didn't matter which the right answer was, he couldn't lie. The astronomer knew the truth, and no amount of pain, no matter how intense or how long they submitted him to it, would change what he now knew. Disappointed with the astronomer's steadfastness, the advisor signals to the torturer, who cranks the rack again, stretching the astronomer's body to the point where he feels like his bones might pop out of their sockets. Recant, the advisor screams, repeating the word over and over, growing louder as the astronomer's own cries increase from the pain caused by the torturer cranking the rack more and more. The astronomer closes his eyes again. He's certain this will be the end of him soon and that he will die with the great secret he's learned without getting the chance to share it with the world. But suddenly, the astronomer notices that the room has gone quiet, the advisor is no longer yelling, and the torturer has stopped operating the machine. The astronomer opens his eyes to see the advisor and the torturer both in a deep bow. His gaze continues up and he sees… the king himself standing in front of him. The king stares at the astronomer for what feels like an eternity, before simply asking, is it true? The astronomer, limbs still stretched on the rack, manages a nod, and with his remaining strength whispers, it's true. The king motions with his hand to the torturer, who stands up and begins releasing the astronomer from his constraints. The advisor protests, but my lord, this man… But he's cut off by the king with a stern look, and retreats back into his deep bow. Show me, the king says, as the astronomer stands rubbing his sore shoulders where the tendons and muscles were stretched far beyond their natural limits. The astronomer opens the door to his laboratory and gestures for the king to enter. The room is a mess of papers and scientific equipment, a reflection of the busy and scattered mind of the man who works here. The king is immediately drawn to a table with a large scroll. He spreads it across the table and examines it, but his face betrays no hint of what he is thinking. Is this what you showed my advisors? The astronomer nods yes. Would you like to see for yourself? The astronomer motions to the window, where a brass tube is attached to a tripod. The king approaches the device, but doesn't know how it works. The astronomer demonstrates by looking through the eyepiece. He moves it slightly, making small adjustments to make sure it is just right for the king. There, now look. The king bends over to peer through the telescope, and a look of shock comes over his face. What he sees is the most incredible thing he has ever witnessed. There, far above up in the sky, unable to be seen by the naked eye, is a man, and he is staring back at him. The planet that this played out on was not Earth, but a bizarre place that is one of the strangest anomalies in the entire SCP Foundation archive. This is SCP-007, also known as Abdominal Planet. SCP-007 is a spherical object located in the abdomen of a young man or rather, in the space where his abdomen should be, since most of the muscle, skin, and organs that should be present simply are not. The subject, a Caucasian male in his mid-twenties of average height and build, does not appear affected by the large missing portion of his body, and has not reported experiencing pain or discomfort of any kind. In the space where his abdominal muscles and organs should be is a small globe composed of soil and water. This sphere, which measures roughly 60 centimeters in diameter, resembles the planet Earth, though the arrangement of the continents does not match any known configuration from our own planet's history. The tiny planet has its own weather patterns, and even a small but still detectable gravitational pull. Perhaps the most fascinating aspect of SCP-007 is that it appears to be inhabited. Microscopic organisms that would correspond to roughly the scale of human beings on Earth have been observed on the surface of the planet. So far, Two distinct intelligent species have been identified, both of whom seem to possess a technological level similar to the 15th century on Earth. It is unknown if the inhabitants of the abdominal planet are aware of the world outside of their planet, and communication attempts with the planet's occupants have been placed on hold by senior Foundation officials, pending further study into what effect an exchange may have on them… or us. 
The human subject within which SCP-007 is located provided the Foundation with a name that he claims to be his, but no records of such a person existing have yet to be located. Upon being questioned about the lack of records, he willfully offered both a social security and driver's license number, but when they were checked against current records, neither had yet to be assigned by the US government. And the mysteries surrounding this man don't stop there. The subject has not shown the need for either food or water, and it is unknown what energy source his body continues to operate on without nutrition. He is capable of both eating and drinking, though, despite the large missing section of his stomach, but it is still not known what happens to the substances after he swallows them. The man has above-average intelligence and scored a 128 on an administered IQ test. He also generally appears friendly and amiable, and expresses only a passing curiosity about the planet located within his abdomen and how it came to be there. When asked about the origins of the planet, he replied very matter-of-factly that, I just woke up one day and there it was. I don't have any idea how it got there. Due to the poorly understood nature of SCP-007, it has been classified as Euclid, and the small planet and the man it resides in are contained in a sealed, comfortably furnished 10 by 10 meter room that the subject is not allowed to leave. The subject is to be monitored closely by Foundation staff and has a weekly chess game with one of the attending doctors, which also serves as an opportunity to evaluate his mental health. So far, he has not shown any signs of mental illness or violent tendencies, and seems to be quite content. In general, he appears happy with his restricted living situation inside the Foundation facility and has made no attempts to escape. The subject has made multiple requests for access to a computer with an internet connection, but due to potential security risks, this request has thus far been denied. Seeing that shadowy figure coming towards him makes the worker turn and run, he hasn't had the time nor the luxury of freezing on the spot, or waiting for it to get closer so he could get a clearer view. He just runs. With every pace, every hurried horrified step, comes the mental image of the strange figure gaining on him. In his head, every movement he catches in the corner of his eye, every shuffling sound he detects, the thing was right behind him, inches away and ready to strike. So he just keeps on running. Only seconds ago, it was just standing under a streetlight, a ways ahead of the worker, barely moving. He calls out to it, assuming it's a person, somebody may be lost or in need of help. But then, it steps into the light, and it's not a person at all. The head of the suit isn't on properly, it droops at an angle like it hasn't been affixed or is barely hanging on. The crude, lazy-eyed face is haphazardly drooping. That too isn't on right, as the entire head sways unnervingly with each approaching step. Maybe underneath the suit, hiding beneath all that dirty orange fur, still coated in grime despite the rain, perhaps there's a person in there, whose arm hefts an old baseball bat as they plod closer and closer to the worker. But all he sees is the monster. The filthy costume might be clumsily made, but the worker instantly recognizes the all-too-familiar resemblance of an orange cat from a popular comic strip. It's what starts him running. That and the blunt weapon the monster is holding as it menacingly makes its way closer. The downpour doesn't let up as the worker turns a corner, met with the sights of two bright, blinding white beams of light cutting through the rain. A car, speeding its way down the road. It catches the worker in its headlights, and he starts frantically waving his arms, encased in the sodden fabric of his jacket. Help! Oh, please! Please help me! He yells. Something's coming after me! I think it's trying to kill me! The driver doesn't stop, instead simply cruising past. The worker can just about see through the passenger side window, the vehicle's sole occupant giving him a strange look from inside the safety of his car. Almost as quickly as it appears, the car has driven off, its headlights already fading from view thanks to the rain. What the worker doesn't realize is that the driver's look of confusion wasn't directed at him, but at the thing following him. The creature gives a low, animalistic sound, which causes the worker to spin around. Now he sees it, right up close in all its foul, ginger glory. A tail dangles lazily from the lower portion of the suit, trailing in puddles laden with muck, the water making the fur even dirtier than it already is. It's so close that the awful, pungent stench of the thing hits the worker's nostrils, a sickening smell that somehow seems to fit with the grim, gross costume and its wearer. Seeing the wet, fur-coated suit so close, he realizes that it isn't covered in the soft, plush, synthetic coat that he expects a costume like that to be made of. It looks real, like actual cat hair, on a huge humanoid shape with the legs and arms of a man. Arms that were midway through swinging a baseball bat right at the worker's head. 
He ducks just in time, the dull wooden bat glancing off the bricks of a nearby building, narrowly missing the worker's head. As it bounces off the wall, the blunt weapon slips from the soggy gloves of the suit and clatters to the ground. The second he hears the wooden bat land on the ground, the worker turns his heel and runs again, taking advantage of those precious few seconds to get further distance between him and his attacker. It's only exactly as he turns his back that he wishes he'd reached for the bat himself to fight back. Rushing further down the rain-swept street, the worker can hear the heavy slumping footsteps of the suited attacker giving chase. He alternates between looking straight ahead, the raindrops streaming down his face and getting into his eyes, and daring to glance back over his shoulder. Every time he does, he's met again with the horrifying sight of the suit behind him. He wants nothing more than to escape, to get out of this nightmare wherein he is soaked head to toe in rainwater and fear, running for his life, from someone dressed as the comic strip cat he sees every day. But as strong as his will to escape is, he can't bear to let the first suited pursuer out of his sight for even a second. If he can't see it, then it might be anywhere. At least looking told him that he was still right behind him, bearing down on the worker with its bat now firmly back in hand. The shrill noise of chain links rattling sounds behind him, as the attacker in the suit starts striking a nearby fence, making the worker more and more aware that, with every strike, it's getting closer. Through the relentless downpour, the worker spots a shape standing on the sidewalk, just a few feet ahead. Short, stationary, something he sees every day of his life but never pays any notice to. But tonight, it might just be the thing that saves his life. A trash can. It's full, and that means heavy, and any second now, he'll be close enough to reach it. A plan forms in seconds, erupting like a fire with gasoline thrown on it. If that gasoline was pure, terrified adrenaline of being chased by someone in an orange cat costume, Reaching out, as soon as his fingertips grip the wet metal rim of the can, the worker pulls as hard as possible, his instincts keeping him from stopping running. The trash can clatters behind him as he passes, followed by the heavy thud of the attacker falling to the ground as it trips over the obstacle and lands furry head first in the garbage now strewn over the sidewalk. The worker knows he's only got another short window, another blessing of a precious few seconds to get far enough away from his attacker. He turns, changing course to rush across the street. There's an old warehouse over there. If there are security guards working, they might be able to help. If not, and the place is unguarded, then at least it could be somewhere to hide. A sudden blaring noise pierces the worker's eardrums before he can make it all the way to the opposite sidewalk. It's a horn, coupled with a bright pair of lights appearing as if from nowhere. Then, before he can turn to see it coming, impact. First against the hood of the car, speeding through the rain towards him, unable to stop in enough time. Next, the pain of hitting the jagged blacktop of the road. The second impact, as the worker lands a few feet away, spots of rain still pattering against his face as everything goes from dark to pitch black for a few seconds. His head floods with scenes from earlier that day, as if his life was about to start flashing before his eyes, only in reverse. The news of the comic strip doing poorly arrives at the Paws Inc. office, and with it, the knowledge that, if there are going to be layoffs, then he'll be first. He's the new hire, after all. It didn't matter that the once beloved comic of a cartoon cat is losing its popularity, going stale after so many years in print. It upset the investors, and the worker has been worrying all day if he'd be the one fired to appease them, until he suddenly remembers what's coming after him. Fighting back and clawing his way back to consciousness, he struggles back to his feet, screaming with pain. He's injured, that much he can certainly tell, even if he doesn't know how badly. Hey! Hey, mister! The driver calls, stopping his car and starting to climb out of the vehicle. It's a different driver and car this time, and unlike the first, he makes the effort to stop, a mistake that is about to cost him greatly. He sees the worker getting back up, ignoring his calls. He raises his voice to cut through the noise of the pouring rain. Hey, you okay? I'm so sorry, I didn't see you. My lights were on low, wipers are going, it wasn't until you rushed out across the street that… Anyway, look, let me at least get you to a hospital. We can exchange our insurance information once they get you all patched up. The worker wasn't listening. He hears the driver's words but pays him no mind. He's still so intent on getting away that it takes him a second to realize. The car. It's a way out. And then, the worker makes the same mistake as the driver. He stops. And when he does, he sees what has clambered back to its fur-coated feet and is now shuffling towards the driver. Look out! The worker yells. The driver turns, just in time to see. What the hell? He exclaims. Wait a minute, why are you dressed in a Garfield costume? Whack! The sound of the bat being swung at the driver makes the worker feel sick. He turns his back and moves as quickly as he can towards the warehouse, despite the pain and the horrified screams coming from behind. Beneath the rain, there's something else, a twisted, vile squelching noise that quickly snuffs out the driver's dying cries. 
The worker doesn't dare to look back this time. He doesn't want to see what's happening. Lifting a heavy metal shutter and pulling it shut behind him, he finds himself in the warehouse. It's completely deserted. There isn't a single sign of life anywhere. The only sound is the pattering of rainwater against the hard concrete floor, dripping through a hole in the ceiling. Guided by the low, glowing light of the street lamps outside that bleeds through the warehouse windows, the worker starts fumbling around for a place to hide. Just as he crawls underneath a large pallet rack, he hears a metallic rattling as the fur-suited monstrosity lifts up the shutter. It's inside. With heavy, plodding steps in its suit, it paces up and down the aisles of discarded shelving. The worker clamps his soaked hands against his mouth, trying to mask his panicked breathing, only to let out a scream as he feels something grab his ankle and pull. With ease, the thing dressed as a disheveled Garfield pulls him out of his hiding place. Instinctively, the worker thrashes his legs, landing a solid kick to the creature. As his foot connects, he notices it doesn't feel like a person underneath the suit. There's no body, no familiar outline of a human being beneath all the soggy fur and stench. It's just a slimy mass. Nonetheless, the kick knocks the garish Garfield back, only a few paces, but better than nothing. He scrabbles to his feet, standing and running as fast as he can in the opposite direction, only to hit a wall at the far side of the warehouse. The shutter is the only way out, and right now it's wide open. But Garfield stands between the worker and freedom. He turns to dart down the next aisle, between the rows of shelves, keeping his eyes on the attacker as he passes underneath the hole in the ceiling. The rain is still coming down through it, leaving a puddle on the floor. The worker's focus is locked on the beast. He suddenly feels his foot slipping out from under him, that awful lurch of his heart as he falls. The puddle. He slipped on it and come crashing down to the ground. The force of the concrete striking his back knocks all the breath from his lungs. Everything is spinning in a nauseating mix of pain, disorientation, and terror. Above, through the unrepaired ceiling, drops of rain come pouring down on him. Then, a low, agonized meow from somewhere nearby. The monster, Garfield, brings its bat swinging down and sharply connecting with the worker lying on the ground. A new surge of pain racks his body, right at the hip where the baseball bat just landed in an unforgiving blow. The worker can do nothing but scream in pain and fear. A horrible sound, like something wet tearing, fills his ears over his own cries. He remembers the sickening feeling of a slimy mass being aggressively pushed into his face. It's disgusting, rancid, but even under all the horror and the repulsive taste, he can detect familiar hints. Pasta, beef, tomato sauce, cheese, all of it moldy and rotten, but still recognizable. The monstrous SCP-3166 forces further fistfuls of lasagna down the worker's throat until the screaming stops. He'd always hated Mondays. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-674, The Exposition Gun Makes Nintendo Real Life.